Okay, everybody, it's 1.15. We said 1.15, and here we are. We're ready to roll. And, of course, aside from a wounded um, Dr. Maxwell, who hit you? Did Dr. Jarrah just punch you in the arm? <laughs> wow. Violence all the time. What can we do? Welcome. Okay, we are here, and it is agenda item 84. Reports and presentations and report from Dr. Jesus F. Jara, Superintendent, Clark County School District, CCSD, regarding a status update on various educationally related matters within the CCSD. And we have you being introduced by none other than the wonderful Dr. Mars Hibbler. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of the Council, Lisa Morris Hibbler, Chief Community Services Officer. With me today is Dr. Uh, Jesus Jara, the Superintendent, and Dr. Michael Maxwell, the Acting Director of Youth Development and Social Innovation. And we also have Dr. Joe Morgan, the Assistant Professor at UNLV and a co director of Targeted Creative Solutions um, here in the audience. And Dr. Morgan has been integral to the research and data collection and analysis of our programs. So today we will be providing providing an update on the Focus 24 plan and the educational partnerships between the Clark County School District and the City of Las Vegas. You've heard me say before that strong cities are built on a foundation of strong families and empowered neighborhoods that support every child. And so Las Vegas, like many cities across the country, is committed to working across systems with multiple stakeholders to ensure all children have opportunities for high quality education. This is irrespective of the fact that we do not oversee the school district. Education drives a healthy economy, impacting all areas of our community, and the steps that we take to strengthen neighborhoods and improve outcomes for children and youth are among the most important investments that we will, <clears throat> excuse me, that we make in the health and economic vitality of our communities. One of the council priorities is to support the continued education from pre-K to workforce development. And there has been a concerted efforts towards that goal. And uh, part of that is through the pre-K infrastructure development, Strong Start Academies and Strong Start Go, improving attendance and reducing chronic absenteeism, both through awareness and through interventions, using after school programs and summertime for extended learning. Also our um, integrated full service community school model that part of that program led us to be named an All-American City, and then also um, expanding our pathways to education and workforce through the Strong Future Youth Employment Program. This is just a list of our programs and partnerships, but we have been doing more than just these programs that we have uh, before you today. We've also been serving on the School Justice Partnership, the Superintendent's Equity and Access um, Committee, the Commission on School Funding, so and and working with the um, education, leg the legislature, um, education committee. Those are a number of ways that we influence. Those are a number of ways that we advocate, and a number of ways that we engage. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Hibbler, and good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Great and excited to be here and sharing a little bit about some of the work that took place last year in my first year and celebrating and really getting into the weeds, into the education, into student, our student outcomes. So I really appreciate the partnership on behalf of Clark County School District. So as you know, um, last, last February, the board, board of Trustees adopted a Focus 2024, which is our five-year strategic plan, which brings um, very rigorous and ambitious goals. And, and the reason that they are ambitious and rigorous is because there's nothing uh, more important in this community than our children's education. We have some ways to go, um, and um, we have a great team, and I know a great partnership with the city of Las Vegas. So obviously, when you look at an increasing our student achievement and academically increasing our student achievement and really narrowing of the achievement gaps that we're facing within our school. So when you look at our academic achievement data as a whole, um, you know, we, you know, we made some minor improvements. I don't consider them um, a very, um, really 
Um, I'm not excited about the growth, but we did not go, we didn't go down and we went up a little bit and especially in our high schools, we went up almost two percentage points, close to a percentage points in, in, in ELA and mathematics. So it was, it was uh, moving in the right direction, but not necessarily as I, as I expected and want to and really where we need to move forward. One of the things that um, we also highlight here is where we are not only Clark County, but where the city of Las Vegas schools lie. Um, we separated that, the, that information for you, where you see we have some challenges and some gaps in our high school English language arts and our middle school and our high school mathematics. So we have an opportunity here. And I, I, I say this, um, in what I, one of the things that I've been able to really get into the academic data and into, our, into what we're seeing in our classrooms, in an effort to move forward, we, in an organizational structure that we reorganized the district, I, I believe I share this with this council and the mayor last year where we went into regions, I felt it's important to break down the little bit of the district and bring some consistency as a whole. We used to have about 13 school associate superintendents, now we have three, a little bit more of um, a strategic vision down to the classroom level. So it was important to do that uh, and hear the results from that. There. One of the things that when you look at, and one of the things that we need to be honest around our data is really our achievement gaps, and we break it down by student groups. I don't call it uh, subgroups because all students are students, and we call them all student groups. There's no sub in our student population. Um, when you look at, we made some gains, but we have some gaps, um, and especially around our, our minority our minority, our black, our brown children that we face within our schools. And, and again, broken down as well. One of the things that we have here in ELA and mathematics, um, some of the largest gaps are, like I said, is it's around our, our, our minority children. One of the things that we're very clear and, and really appreciate Dr. Hibbler serving in, in partnership with us in, in uh, My Brother's Keeper Alliance, I think it's important for us um, be a, a huge part of that success. One of the things that when we shared our data last year and at the end of the year and looking at our suspension data, which is what one of the things that we're turning. Last year we suspended around our schools around 31,000 student suspensions. Okay. That's way too many. So we really have to change the focus and, and, and really get into schools because they're not in school, they can't learn. So one of the things that we're very clear in, in really how we provide in, within our school justice partnership. And I think, I, I really appreciate you allowing us to borrow Dr. Hibbler, because she also serves in that committee and serves in a lot of the work because you are cre key partners for us. So what, some of the other work that we're doing around refocus, our efforts are maintaining that our children are in school with us. Um, access and equity, that is critical for not only um, this community, but for our children. Some of the things that, that we continue now, what we're assessing our, our we're assessing our data. How do our feel? How do our staff, students, and parents feel about about um, you know our, our efforts and our culture in our school? So we we do a culture and inclusive school analysis. Again, our school justice partnership. If you saw about a month ago, we changed the criteria in our magnet schools because when we started digging into the data, we saw that our magnet schools phenomenal nationally recognized, but we weren't serving all kids. So we, we took away some of the criterias, um, not lowering the standards, not lowering the, the academic rigor, but giving more access to students. We, today we have seen that we've um, seen an increase of about 1,200 students applying into our magnet. So, so we're, we're excited about that. Again, increasing our college and career readiness, increase AP, our advanced coursework in our in our middle schools and apprenticeship programs. We all, we all know very clear that not all kids are going to college. So how do we help our students when they graduate get into a, um, a high paying job as well? So high skills and high paying job for our students. One of the things that we have not invested as a, as a school system, it's in leadership development. Um, when you started looking at the budget um, for the last eight to 10 years, we have not invested in our people, in our, in our staff. So one of the things that I'm really excited about, something that we forged this year with, uh, within Clark County School District with national experts and NWEA, Khan Academy, and ANET are really partnering with us to provide job embedded professional development for our teachers and for our principals. Again, providing students an opportunity, uh, our, our adults an opportunity to invest in them as well. We have a balanced assessment system uh, for the first time. Now we know where 
whether you're a student in city of Las Vegas or you're in Moapa, you're in Laughlin, and within the entire county, I'm able to now track and monitor how all our, our 320,000 children are doing within the K-9. So then it gets, gives us the opportunity for us to pinpoint into the individual data for each student. So it's really exciting of where we're going as well as a community. Again, ambitious goals, but our children deserve nothing but the best. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Maxwell. Good afternoon, Mayor Goodman and Council. Um, again, Dr. Michael Maxwell, Acting Director of YDSI, Youth Development and Social Innovation. And I am happy to be here uh, again to talk about a couple of the programs that we have uh, within YDSI and talk about some of the outcomes, especially our Strong Start and also our Reinvent Schools. Um, but before I go on, I do want to make sure that I thank Drs. Uh, Jara and Dr. Hibbler for uh, just being great partners and of course Lisa being a great leader and, and boss to work for. So, uh, and with that, I will go into um, our first, go into the initiative for our Strong Start. So looking at um, what we are trying to do. So Strong Start Early Learning Academies, uh, including the mobile. Maybe there we go. With one arm. There we go. <laughs> I think I can still make it. Uh, we serve early learners from infant to five years old. Um, high quality early childhood education has proven to have the greatest impact on dual language learners, children with special needs, and children from low income households. So Strong Start Las Vegas provides high quality programs that foster early learning and development for our youngest citizens. Okay. So we have three academies, three brick and mortar academies, one Strong Start Academy at Lorenzi, Strong Start Academy at Alta, and then Strong Start Stupac. And you can see the numbers there before you uh, that are served at each, each location. Um, the, uh, our Strong Start locations are operated by, the brick and mortar uh, operations are conducted by Ocelero Learning. They are the Head Start grantee for Southern Nevada. Uh, so they have a complete curriculum, they have activities, uh, that are well suited for three and four year olds, but then they also are serving infants and toddlers also. So in a couple of our facilities, we have kids that are served from just a few weeks old through five years old. Um, so infant infants and toddlers through five years old. Uh, Ocelero Learning, they are the Head Start grantee and they also use, again, we talked about, I talked about curriculum, but they have male involvement activities. So you will see fathers that are highly involved at the centers, at the Strong Start centers. Um, not only just bringing kids back and forth to the school, but also there are regular activities that um, are meant to engage fathers. And so when you go to the schools, you will see, or to the academies, you will see pictures of fathers and families up on the wall because they understand how important that is for the families to be engaged, but especially also getting fathers involved. So then we have our Strong Start Academy, our mobile uh, pre-K Academy, Strong Start Go. Um, and that, op that opened last year, or in the spring actually of this year, last school year. Um, and when it opened, uh, this was the first, or is the first uh, Strong Start Go, um, which introduces an innovative system of delivering high quality pre-K uh, education, where we can actually take the Strong Start Go, the Mobile Pre-K Academy, into communities with the greatest need. Um, and right now, the two locations that we serve are in West Las Vegas, 89106, right behind the West Las Vegas Art Center. And the other center, uh, the other location, is actually right between the East Yard and the park on um, uh, Washington and, and Mojave, uh, across from the fire station and across from the uh, animal hospital. So with our Strong Start Mobile, um, we also have <clears throat> one more uh, facility that is in design right now, and that's the Strong Start Academy at Wardell. That is a partnership with the Housing Authority. There we go. That is a partnership with the Housing Authority. Um, it's gonna be a 13,000 square foot facility with uh, 10 classrooms. And we are looking at that being uh, a fully just a four-year-old 
uh, facility that serves just four-year-olds. And the intent behind that is so that we have 200, up to 200 four-year-olds that every year when they, when they uh, promote from uh, Strong Start Wardell, those 200 kids will go right into schools that are in Ward 3. Um, so we want to see an impact almost immediately with kindergarten, and then we will be able to track those students over the years uh, longitudinally to see how they're doing and how much of an impact they're making on our schools. So that's Strong Start Wardell. The next page that I have there here is just a sample of an assessment that we do with our kids at the very beginning, and this is from a Brigant's uh, assessment. It's important for you to understand where our kids are actually starting out. Um, so our initiative is called Strong Start, and you can see from some of the indicators on this assessment why we actually need to provide a Strong Start. Um, if you look there, um, we ask students colors. Can you tell us, can you identify colors? Can you identify parts of your body? Um, recognizes quantities. So when you see some of those, that many of those dash marks, those are indications that the kids that are coming in at the very beginning do not they cannot uh, identify those colors, body parts, and so forth. Um, so there is quite a bit of ground to make up, um, but with our programming, we make sure to uh, accelerate what the children are exposed to uh, as far as vocabulary, literacy, um, counting, so forth. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Maxwell, are you at first, even before you go to that, are you having an eye and hearing exam in, uh, at the beginning as you begin to admit students and make your selection? We have not uh, integrated uh, health services and screenings, but we, at our strong, at our brick and mortar locations, we do have those screenings available, but we have not done that with I would strong highly start recommend, goal. even before you go into anything, that you make sure the child can see, mm -hmm. yes. because his parents don't parent so well to show them colors and ask them questions. They may not know their child can't hear and can't see. And right. that really, uh, that needs to be step one, I think, even before you do this, which is um, something that um, we had discussed, Dr. Hibbler, way back. Um, as this program was trying mm -hmm. to integrate into uh, the three and four year old to get them ready for kindergarten. Um, and I don't know if the district does it at all and at what point they do an a physical assessment of hearing, sight, et cetera. We, we do not, um, but something that certainly it's critical. Yep. I mean, really, I've seen it so often over the years. A we, child who, until third grade, yeah. could never do anything, but it was because they couldn't see. Mm -hmm. So I just highly recommend that yep. it be a, a preliminary to this. Yep. Um, and early intervention is, is key, and you're, you're right. So we will take immediate steps to uh, get some screening available to our kids, uh, both hearing Thank you. and vision. Thank we you. Will. Um, the next slide, you have uh, another assessment for three-year-olds, but similar results. Um, of course, the three-year-olds, they missed a, uh, quite a bit more information than the, than the four-year-olds. Um, so the next slide, you start to see some of the demographics of the kids that we are serving. Um, high percentage, uh, almost half, uh, or a little bit more than half, are African-American and then uh, Hispanic and Latino. Uh, and then you see that we have low levels of most of the other uh, demographics. Um, the students that are being served uh, coming from a number of different zip codes, 89, but mostly from 89106, 89108, 032, 031, and 030. With all of our Strong Start locations, the brick and mortar locations, the children are coming from over 45 zip codes. Um, so they're coming from all over, and what we tend to see is that some of the parents are actually putting their kids into our programs as they make their way into uh, work. If they're heading in onto the strip or wherever it may be, they're actually taking advantage of it for that, for that reason. Um, so the next slide, you'll start to see some of the outcomes for our kids. And that is <clears throat> when you look at our four-year-olds, uh, as far as the social emotional gains, that's in the blue. Um, you will see that across the three brick and mortar locations, social emotional gains are pretty substantial. Um, 
we're not showing the individual gains. We're looking at the gains per, um, per site uh, because we don't want to show the individual student information. Um, but we are working on that so that we can, through the data systems that are available to us, to be able to generalize, generalize those and um, remove any identifiable information so that we can then show you, say, per, uh, for example, per aver the average gains that are made by students. Um, and so if you also look at the three-year-olds, you'll see the same thing. 100% um, of the students at Lorenzi, for example, um, had indicated, showed gains uh, on the assessments. And for our assessments, we use Teaching Strategies Gold, which is the same assessments that the school district uses in their pre-K, and it's used nationwide. Um, so we, uh, you saw the uh, assessment earlier with the Brigantes. We do the Brigantes pre and, po pre and post. And then with Teaching Strategies Gold, we do that three times a year with our, our students. And again, as far as making sure that their vision and hearing are, uh, are up to snuff, that could have a play as far as the, the progress that students are making. So we will. I'm wondering, too, if I might interrupt again. I'm sorry. But um, at Wardell, as you're looking at the construction and, and uh, how that's set up, where you could bring the children. I mean, certainly we have so many mm -hmm. um, ophthalmologists, optometrists that, right. that are very successful in town. And I'm sure they would love to do this on a volunteer basis every periodic time. Um, but wondering in Wardell if you can just set up an area so there can be that type of testing. You could bring your uh, strong start go students over there before you admit, and the ones obviously on Alta and everywhere else. So the testing component doesn't have to travel so much. It's just we bust them over. Right, Mayor um, Lisa Morris Sibler. Uh, <clears throat> we've actually been in communication with volunteers, volunteers in medicine. Um, as well as I Care for Kids. So I Care for Kids is one of our partners that's mobile, and so we've been looking at those mobile services. So we will definitely, um, you know, put something in place for Strong Start Go. But we do have some partners that have expressed an interest. With, you know, we like the mobile services because transportation sometimes is a problem, and so that's why at the Strong Start Academies, the physical facilities have those services or has a provider. The mobile has proven to be a little bit more challenging, but we'll certainly and get that in place. it should be mandated for every child. Mandated. Yes. <coughs> you can't lose one. Mm -hmm. Every child counts. Right. So. Um, and as you brought that up, our reInvent schools, we have those services, as Dr. Hibbler said, you know, the mobile services. So it's just a matter of doing the same thing with our, with our mobile, and okay. that's bringing them out. Um, we can actually probably get parents to also take, take advantage of some of the services, too. Right. So. Thank you. All right, so moving from our uh, Strong Start Academies, we also want to look at our reInvent schools. Um, our reInvent schools started uh, in, as a partnership between the Clark County School District and the City of Las Vegas in 2016. Uh, we have four areas that we focus on, and that's uh, academic enrichment, extended learning opportunities, health and social supports, and then family and community engagement. So those are our major priorities. Uh, that we focus on as part of our, as our, with our program. Um, we also have a City of Las Vegas Safe Key before and after school program, which focuses on uh, academic enrichment. Um, at our reInvent schools, Safe Key is scholarship. So we remove that barrier as far as parents being able to bring their kids um, to school on time. Um, they can actually bring their kids to, if they're working, they can bring their kids to Safe Key at our reInvent schools, and again, it is free. So we don't have to, they don't have to worry about maybe leaving their kids at home and then expecting the kids to get to school on time, or uh, come to school on their own. Um, and so we have our Safe Key available for kids before and after school. Um, we have AmeriCorps, and we have a sizable number of AmeriCorps service members. We have 50 that serve at the 13 reInvent schools. Um, and they focus on chronic absenteeism and also liter literacy support. Um, so they serve as chronic absentee or absent, uh, absentee success, absent attendance success mentors is what we call them. Uh, and then we, they also provide uh, literacy support. So they provide tutoring um, during the day and a few of them after, after school also. Um, 
And then we have summer learning academies. This past summer, we, oper we had two summer learning academies. One was operated out of uh, Red Rock Elementary School, and the other one was operated out of Canberra um, Elementary School. With our summer learning academies, they are not relegated to just the students from that school. They actually open up the schools. That's something that we talk about with the principals prior to opening the summer learning academies, that we want the students from a, the larger neighborhood, the larger community, whoever can actually get to the school by walking or possibly even driving, we want them to be, to be able to come to the Summer Learning Academy. So that is a, a uh, large um, or a unique uh, thing that, to our Summer Learning Academies. Uh, and then finally, we also have our Safe Summer Nights and Fall Festivals. Um, these are uh, very successful activities that bring out parents and students um, parents and students for, it's basically similar to a resource fair, but it's also, um, uh, we have music, um, the teachers are there, the staff, staff are there, there's all kinds of games uh, and activities, and many of them also focus on uh, some academic areas like literacy, you know, using ma utilizing math during the games and so forth. Um, so that's our reInvent Schools, an overview. Now I kind of want to get into some of the successes. And uh, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. When you look at uh, Cambero Elementary, which came on to our program or joined our program last year, um, you notice particularly in reading is what I focus on because we are AmeriCorps service members. As I said earlier, they provide literacy, literacy tutoring. Um, we have literacy elements that are built into SafeKey. Um, so uh, Apple Corps, Reader's Theater, um, and then we, of course, encourage ki kids to constantly read while they are in uh, safe key. So if you notice, you see the results um, at Cambero Elementary. You see the uh, year before, in 17, 18, they were at about 35%. And then last year, they went all the way up to 52%. <laughs> now, can reInvent schools take all of the credit for that? No, we work in partnership with the school district, of course, and then with the teachers, but we do like to think that we are definitely having a major piece, uh, or a major part in some of the successes at the school. Um, so there's Cambiero or Cambero. Um, then when you look at Doris Reed, the Doris Reed, same, same thing, just under 20% um, last year or excuse me, yeah, just under 20% the year before, and then last year with us, it jumped up to about 26%. So again, the numbers sort of speak for themselves, and then lastly, I wanted to show you Ali Detweiler. Um, Ali Detweiler, just over 30% um, last year, or the year before, and then last year jumped up to just under 40%, so about 38%. Um, I wanted to particularly show you these three schools because these are the three schools that made up the last cohort um, that joined reInvent Schools. And so one of the things that we asked over the last year was to actually do our programs to fidelity. Um, prior to that, you had some principals that were kind of, when you have an additional four uh, bodies at the school, um, principals want to use them in ways that you know, they see fit and they think are needed, which is part of their autonomy. But what we, what we asked last year was, please use our programs to fidelity, and these are the three schools that had the greatest uh, successes. So that's why I wanted to show you those, and then you'll see it again on the next slide. Um, 10 of our 13 schools saw um, substantial gains in literacy um, last year. And so if you look at Clark County School District last year, the growth, rate of growth was at 1.8%, but then if you look at our, um, our reInvent schools uh, over the last three years, 25.5% at Cambero Elementary. Uh, vale Pittman just joined us this year, um, so we can't take credit for Vale Pittman at all, um, but we do look forward to seeing some great in, uh, increases with Vale Pittman next year. And then also, uh, some of the others, Ali Detweiler, again, 17.5% rate of growth, and then Doris Reed at 6.3. So our schools are really, our, our programs are really having an impact um, on, on uh, student achievement. Um, again, partnering with the teachers, partnering with the principal, working as a solid team, we know that we can get results like this. Um, and the improvements that we've seen, especially on the last few, uh, few slides, 
They show you that overall progress, not just in literacy, but you saw the overall progress. Um, one of the things that we want to add is we now, with our partnership and working with Dr. Jara uh, and his deputies, we now have access to Infinite Campus which allows us to really dig into each and every student's um, um, academic growth and performance, whether it's behavior, academics, we will be able to see that. And we did not have that access before, but when we asked Dr. Jara and said we really need to be able to see so that we can prove what we're doing, we need access to Infinite Campus. And we got that access, and so we're getting trained on that now. So I look forward to be, being able to give you even greater numbers next year um, for, our, uh, for our report. And then also with our early childhood, the Department of Education has created a, uh, in Infinite Campus, they've created an early learning district. And through our partnership with them, all of our kids that are in Strong Starts are now going to be entered into the Infinite Campus Early Learning District, which means we will be able to see the students' results longitudinally all the way through graduation. That's a huge step, but it takes partnerships that like what we have with the Clark County School District and with the Department of Education. Um, but we are definitely having an impact, and so I wanted to make sure that the council knows, and with your support, uh, our schools are really making some great gains. We've got a long way to go, but we've make, we're making those gains, and we appreciate your support. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Sorry, I think I left out. Um, so I want to say that when you see that when our schools make gains, don't make gains, or whatever, the, the great thing about having a partnership with Dr. Um, Joe Morgan um, and UNLV uh, is that he digs into that so that we can learn what's working, what's not working, we can make those course corrections. And I think that's critically important. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We need to run it quickly, but it still is a marathon. So when you see those gains or if you see some schools that didn't, doesn't mean that the program is not working. It means we have to take Take a step back. So at this time, if I may, want to bring up? Uh, yeah. Dr. If we could bring up Dr. Joe Morgan. His parents are visiting here today, also in the audience. Thank you, parents, for coming in. And we wow. interrupted their sightseeing downtown. We want to get them back out there for that. But thank you so much. With Dr. Uh, Morgan here, um, we had that great news, and that's the last actual bullet on the slide is the announcement of the grant that was received uh, for $2.5 million to support our reInvent schools. And if it were not for Dr. Morgan putting that grant together, he's very humble, um, <laughs> we might not have gotten that grant at all. So we are very appreciative of the work of Dr. Morgan. Well, welcome back. You've been helping us for a long, <laughs> long time. Yes, and we have a couple of things, Mayor, if you will, indulge us to give Dr. Morgan. So one is, um, how about a vacation? Right. <laughs> it's coming. <I> know. <laughs> one is a proclamation from the city council for Dr. Joseph Morgan Day. And um, can I read it? Is that okay? I don't want to take up too much of y'all's time. But uh, whereas Joseph Morgan is and has been a committed servant and leader to the city of Las Vegas and the students we represent, and Joseph Morgan has worked alongside Las Vegas City staff and the Clark County School District staff and countless community partners to improve the quality of education for Las Vegas students. And Joseph Morgan and his team at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas have developed trainings, programs, and services for Las Vegas students and their families. And Joseph Morgan is a dedicated husband, son, brother, uncle, and friend. And the city of Las Vegas is indebted to Joe Morgan for his tireless work on behalf of children everywhere. And now we, the mayor and members of the Las Vegas City Council, proudly proclaim October 16, 2019, as Dr. Joseph Morgan Day, and it is very, very well deserved. Uh, we also have a plaque. We figured we would, uh, in addition to the proclamation, we would also give Dr. Morgan a plaque so that he can basically have one at home and one uh, oh, in the office. Thank you. <laughs> so I also would like to read this one. This is very short. Uh, with our deepest appreciation, the city of Las Vegas honors Dr. Joseph Morgan in recognition of your educational effort and commitment for reInvent Schools Las Vegas. Wonderful. Thank you.
And Mayor, that concludes our report. Thank you. Thank you, I, and certainly Dr. Jara. I just, uh, Dr. Morgan's been with us for yep. I don't know how many years. It seems you've been part of our life, even though you're so young for the <laughs> longest time, and doing data and just really helping coordinate and pull us together, become part of the university soul as well as ours. And so this is just grand because we know to write a child off, um, mm -hmm. children learn from the moment Obviously, uh, physicians will tell you while they're in the womb, but in my opinion, as soon as they're here and those little eyes open, yep. every minute counts. And so to be able to start to deal with um, what we're doing with the preschool and the infants even, but for everything that you've meant to this city, thank you so much. We are so grateful. It's been so important because without facts, you don't really have much of anything. That's right. So we thank you. And mom and dad, you must be very proud. <laughs> and we're proud and we're grateful. Your genes are very good. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Jara, thank, you. thank you also. Are, we, now, are you going to tell us what happened to your arm? I cannot pinpoint any one thing that led to this uh, to expect, suspected uh, torn rotator cuff. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. But, 14 year, twin 14 year old boys that I try to keep up with. So there you I, are. I can blame you. There you are. <laughs> Sorry I asked. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Hibbler. And any, yes, please. I do, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you all for what you do, uh, both collaborations with the city and uh, with the Clark County School District. Uh, it is imperative that we have these relationships, as you guys mentioned. Um, many times and we cannot accomplish this with one without the other um, as you know we have 12 reinvent schools now was 13, 13 12 now and 13. seven of them are located within ward five and so this is an extremely important initiative that the city uh, advances and yep. uh we we don't take it lightly we work hand in hand with with you in order to ensure that um, our schools are are getting its fair shake as well you see some of the schools that were there some of the reports that you put in I think two of those were in Ward 5 of the three that you showed. So uh, we we want to do everything we can to help support and to grow our reinvent schools and our programs and relationships with mm -hmm. uh, with with the uh, school district. It, Dr. Hodder, uh, is there something that you think that we something else we could be doing? You know what it, what. I know we're doing a lot, it seems, and, and I'm going to go on the record and say I think we're doing more than most as a, as a uh, municipality, but is there something else that you think you'd like to see that maybe we can work on with you? No, uh, Mayor and, and um, Council McCreary, I, I think one of the things that we have done this year is really tighten up the partnership and the expectations. You heard a little bit of the sharing of the data. Some of the things that we have done as a school system uh, is really to get into more of um, uh, some set them some expectations as a whole uh, to, to really hold um, some of the adult accountability. Mm -hmm. I think what you're doing is great. I think we're now bringing it all together uh, and becomes part of the fabric at the school. So I think the partnership at the, at, with my deputy superintendent and then the regional staff and then the principals, so they see the value maybe, and I don't want to speak for the past, maybe they didn't see the value. So I think now including it as part of the school improvement plan it becomes part of that fabric, and I think that's where you're going to start seeing some gains. As a system, one of the things, that I, and that's why I wanted to include it in there, one of the things that we have not done, um, you know, and, and my board has been very clear because I've been sharing that, is really investing in a, adult professional learning on our teachers and our principals and our assistant principals. So that's what we are focused on this year. And then that's going to then start really where we're going to see some of the data start moving in the right direction. So what you're doing is great, and I think it's enough because then it'll become part of the fabric that we then become um, one collective whole for that school. You know, we hosted, I might have told you this, we hosted a dinner with the principals of our schools in our ward and then uh, a couple of high schools that feed into our ward. And I got to tell you, uh, and it was my first time last year doing it. We're going to do it again this year. But it was an amazing experience because these principals got together and it was, they yeah. brought maybe the vice principals. And some of them have, have not spoken to each other. Correct. And, and it was powerful when uh, they got up and told their story. If, if even just from 
uh, you know, how do you manage dealing with your own maintenance, or how do you manage yeah. dealing with this? And they sort of shared stories, and it was great to get them in a the room. And yeah. I look forward to doing it again. I think it was very, very powerful that we that we did this. So thank you, Dr. Maxwell and, and, and Dr. Uh, Moore Sibler for that as well. Just one more question. You know, it seems like every year, and this is before you've you've come and in here, you know, we're challenged at the start of the school year, come about July or August, it starts coming out that we have a shortage of teachers, that we're always scrambling to find teachers. Um, and I just believe that if you're scrambling at the last minute to find teachers, I don't know, you know, the quality ones are probably working. And here we are trying to find people. And, and how do we get ahead of that, do you think? We're hiring now. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I mean, I, and you're right. I think it just really start start addressing and, and making sure that we strengthen. And we have a great partnership with UNLV, Nevada State College. So how do we strengthen that partnership so then we can then start hiring or lead hiring the interns that we have now? Um, you know, and these are some of the things that we're working on. And then being a little bit more strategic when we're recruiting. Uh, and then also retaining our teachers. One of the things that we're trying to now get into is why our teachers leaving mm -hmm. our school system, so then we can pinpoint what the what the what the challenges are, so that we can address them. And if they're leaving certain schools to go to other schools, and 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 so we're we're you know taking a close look at all that data. I have a new chief of HR um, that's been fo laser focused on on the teacher pipeline, but then also um, you know it's just the, the hiring process. That we have to that we have to then just get ahead of ourselves and then start looking at using some of the strategies in some other urban districts. What they do is they offer they offer contracts to the interns as they're still mm -hmm. as they're still finishing their last semester to then offer them a contract early on because we know we're going to have vacancies. So how do we start getting ahead of what other school systems are doing? Not obviously not in Nevada, but when we go to you know to, to Arizona, um, Texas, and some of those places to try to get ahead of it if that's what we're going to do. Well, we'd love to assist. Um, you know, we have a pipeline of our newsletters, our social media channels, different things to get information out, and I would love to include Absolutely. that information. If you send it over, have someone send it over to your office, we'll make sure we include yeah. it in, in our, yep. our, our newsletters. And you're way too kind, Dr. Jar. It goes back to the legislature. It goes back to the government and the state, but that we are far behind in salaries and benefits that attract. In order to attract and keep the best, you have to pay them. And when you allocate in the Clark County School District $5,700 per child, when in other communities, up in the more wealthy communities, they're getting a better distribution mm -hmm. of dollars, his work is severely handicapped. And this has been a call that needs to be addressed yeah. in this state. The money needs to be in education to bring, attract, and keep the best. And until we have that and until our legislative body is responsive enough to get the Department of Education allocating the appropriate funds, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I agree. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hanna. You. You're the best. Thank You're you. The best. So, yes. Uh, Mayor, Please. thank you. And Dr. Hanna, thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Moore Sibler, and there's a bunch of doctors up there, so thank you all. Uh, Dr. Morgan, can you come back down? I, I rarely get to do anything, but this is something that's really important to me. Uh, Dr. Morgan and I actually sat most, most times at a bar um, and came up with this. I never it's thought true. that of you. Dr. Morgan, I knew yes. was a drinker, but. Uh, but we, we, we came up with, and when I say we, I mean Dr. Morgan came up with a large part of the city's educational initiatives yes. um, eight or nine years ago. Yes. And so I've been working with Dr. Morgan for many years um, on looking at ways the, the city can engage in appropriate fashions. Um, and because of that, children's lives are better. As a community, we are blessed to have him here. So I'm grateful his parents are here because the community is blessed to have you here in our, in our town and fighting for children in a way that we all need to fight for children. So all I did was a proclamation, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get a street named after you. I think I can. <laughs> Right? <laughs> we'll see. I'm going to test my limits of what I can do. I think you've done an amazing job here in the city of Las Vegas, and I'm so, so, so grateful that you're here. 
guiding the efforts and um, for Dr. Hara and, and all the doctors up there um, for the work that you do for children. I think this is the most important thing our city can do. Um, our community desperately needs to look at not only our education systems, but our mental health care systems, our transportation systems, our housing systems. All of those have significant impacts on what happens in a classroom. And the city has a key critical role to play in making sure that children are ready and prepared to learn. Um, and I know that's an important component to being in the classroom. Dr. Morgan has taught me that. And so I will forever be an advocate for children because of what Dr. Morgan and the time we have spent together, most times at a bar. Um, but it's been very productive and effective in thinking through how the city can be engaged in education and making the world a little bit better. So on behalf of myself, thank you for making the world better. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, Councilman Knudsen was uh, working on staff at that time that you started with us. And that was in my very first year of my very first term. Yep. So, but whatever you're drinking and he's drinking. <laughs> I wasn't Wonder. working at the time. I was, I was working after hours. Oh. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Let's go to Councilwoman Seaman and then Councilwoman Diaz. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the report and the success of the program. And I just have a question. Um, how proactive is the Clark County School District in creating more magnet schools? We recognized someone this morning, Walter Johnson Junior High School, for their great success. They went from a two-star to a five-star school. And we see the successes of that. And I'm just curious about how proactive we are. Um. One of the things that we're looking at when we looked at the magnet data, as I mentioned, within the criteria, um, Councilwoman Seaman, it was really uh, opening access because we were limiting access to certain students that were not um, able to participate. So that was my priority. So this year, which is what we're doing, one of the things that we're also, we looked at the academic data in kindergarten as well. We, we Our magnet school started in first grade. So then we opened up kindergarten uh, magnets for, for our elementary schools. You know, so as we uh, appreciate the mayor's comments on the, on the funding, so we're, we're with our, our, our funding um, formula and, and we're, we're, our funding that we receive, we have to be strategic in as we're looking at um, the growth. So we have a plan in the next five years. So kindergarten, opening access. The other things that we have um, going as well, uh, Fremont, it's going to become a K-8. One of the things that within the next couple of years, one of the things that we're looking at is making that a dual language. In this community, not having a dual language program to me uh, was a priority as well, um, given that we are an international city with over um, children coming to us from 158 different countries. So one of the things that I wanted to do was a dual language program as well. Um, our bond oversight, I mean, I can, we, we, we're looking at two CTAs. Um, which are what we're seeing is a lot of our kids are coming back into our high schools from charter schools and private schools to our CTA. So we're we're, we're opening up two new ones, and then we have we're really excited um, in the one that um, the old Gorman building that we purchased. We're looking at a workforce. Um, you know, magnet or program there. We don't know what it's going to be, whether it's going to be a magnet. So, you know, I kind of recited a lot of the different things that we have going in the next five years. So it is a priority in how we then make the school relevant for children um, throughout our schools. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank all of you up there for um, ensuring that we're doing our best to uh, provide cradle to career um, educational, exceptional education access to, right? Um, we know that pre K is a fundamental, um, especially for our kids that are at risk and um, come from a challenging um, background mm -hmm. in terms of socioeconomic status and upward mobility. They don't have access, and they start in kindergarten behind, right? And so the more that we can help provide that access, we're doing the work um, to make sure that when they get to kinder, they're where they need to be. Uh, so I am um, very, very much pleased with the city's involvement with the pre-K initiatives here in our city and making sure we have those start, strong start academies, but also the mobiles. And I think that the more we can collaborate with other partners who want to um, expand the scope of work for our community, uh, our kids are going to benefit. And just like the mayor said, every child matters. And so if we're helping, 
I don't know, 40, 60, 80 additional children, it matters um, a lot to them. So kudos on that front, and I'm, I'm glad we have a superintendent that's supportive of pre-K efforts. I think in the past, um, speaking from my experience, I didn't really see the openness to want to embrace and see that pre-K really does matter and is super important, and we need to make sure we're doing our due diligence to provide that. So anything that we can do to expand on that front, um, know that I will be there with you advocating for it. I um, also, being um, someone who represents a ward that's 60% or greater than, uh, in terms of Latino or Hispanic um, students, I am a little concerned about our just for it gaps in terms of achievement between our English language learners and um, those that are not. And I've heard some, um, you know, just very uh, sad, sad numbers or data that basically speak to if our children are not English proficient by the time they leave our elementary schools, it becomes increasingly, if not a long shot for them to get up to par in middle school or high school. And so just wanted to hear a little bit about our efforts in terms of making sure that our programs are not losing sight of making sure we're bolstering that I love that we're trying to be culturally sensitive to our diverse populations, but at the same time, we also need to make sure that we're providing the scaffolding for our English language learners to be successful in the school setting. So what are we doing as a district to make sure that that gap doesn't continue to increase? So um, great question, um, Councilwoman Diaz. One of the things that um, we're creating is something that um, didn't realize that we lacked is a, a literacy plan. We did not have a K-12 literacy plan as a district. What do we expect our children to read in kindergarten, first, second, third, all the way up to high school? So we, we're, we're working on that. We had an ELL master plan, um, but really the way that I see it working is really having a literacy plan and then scaffolding how we support our English language learners within that plan and then provide that professional development for teachers. One of the things that we have witnessed and I witness as I'm walking into the classrooms and I visit classrooms is that we have teachers that are working on strategies but not really addressing the rigor really if you will of the standards. So getting into the technicalities of the education is that we we're spending a lot of time giving strategies but not really setting those high expectations with scaffolding for the children in our ELL classrooms. And, I, and, and, and sometimes, you know, and I face that as an ELL student myself, it was like we have that pobrecito syndrome because you don't speak the language, we're going to put you aside. So this is how do we include them, provide the support. So we're spending a lot of time now and in the spring for next year is to make sure that we provide professional development not only for teachers, but then also for our principals. Because it's, it, it's, our principals also need to have that clear understanding. And it, you know, so thank you for the question, but we are doing some of that work now because when you go back and look at the data for the last five years, it's not very flattering, especially for our students, uh, our ELL students. I appreciate your comment on, on pre-K. As a former high school principal, I said all the time, high school redesign and improvement starts in first grade. And then just my last comment, Madam Mayor, because um, this would be my soapbox and I could talk education all day. But um, last thing is, I, do, I am concerned when I'm seeing the numbers around our math, right? Uh -huh. Math is a universal language. So regardless of whether I'm coming with, you know, if my parents are from China, or my parents are from India, or my parents are from Ecuador, Math is universal. Numbers are numbers. And to see that yeah. we're so underachieving in math gives me a lot of um, anxiety uh, because we know that increasingly the job force of tomorrow requires kids to be high tech, high math skills. And so uh, we need to make sure that we're getting the workforce development um, in our children so that they can meet the demands of tomorrow's jobs. Uh, so what efforts are we doing there to make sure that, because I know that forever we've been focused on literacy, even though we didn't have a literacy plan forever, I know we're like, we got to get the literacy scores up. We got to get them reading. They got to make it. Um, but what about math? I think it's the same thing. And when you get into, um, when you look at um, the curriculum, the alignment, so that's lacking. 
So these are things that we're also looking to to provide the support in for our, for our principals. Again, uh, uh, you, you get into um, I believe is really looking into where we have with it becomes a language barrier and then we put them aside. So I think it's you got to challenge the students. One of the things that we did last last week, October 10th, we because I wanted to really pinpoint. We partner with the college board. The college board has a P, the the Spanish SAT. Um, and we piloted with the first district in, in, in the United States that's doing that in a partnership for our, in a global high school for our newcomers, because I wanted to really look at to see what, if the data, is, is it a language barrier or is it a, is it a competency? So we're waiting for the results, we'll get them within two weeks, so then we can then start placing our children, still, I still call them children even though they're in high school, um, uh, placing our children in the right math courses to then help them and then challenge them because as a kid, they're gonna take the easy way out. So it's how do we then start identifying what their skills and then placing them in the right spot. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, please. So I'm not gonna belabor anything. I'm gonna be really short and sweet. I just wanna let you know, Dr. Hara, I think you're doing an amazing job. We're very lucky to have you here um, as our superintendent. And thank you for bringing your team out. And of course, I'm biased towards Dr. Okay. Hibbler, but she's ours. Okay, it's gonna be learning time. One last lesson, because I've heard it from both sides of me right here. <laughs> Would you tell us Why? about your name and what your father said? Because <laughs> I have announced again and again, you either Jesus Hara or Jesus Jara. And I've said that. Wait till you hear the response. So you know you from did, now Mayor. on in what, first of all, what's your name, please, sir, doctor? No, wait. What is your name? Jesus Jara. I tell you why. Jara. I tell you why. I know. I know. I know, Mayor. Mayor. I make fun of it all the time. Sorry, you, I make you, you do, do it. It's everywhere. my dad. I blame my father. I no, do. My no, poor father. Listen. Rest his soul, please. Uh, so when we moved to Miami uh, from Venezuela, I was in fourth grade, and he, and he had studied uh, in Pittsburgh. He, he was in, uh, an engineer in, uh, from the University of Pittsburgh, and when we moved to to Miami, he said. Your, the J is a hard J in, in English. It was, everybody was okay in the family except Jesus, right? So it was Jara and, and then we tried to change it and we couldn't so it's always just remained Jara. So. But you can Jesus. call me whatever you want and I do love this city and this community. So thank you but so much. To be an old friend of this great guy, you gotta pronounce his name correctly. So it's Dr. Jesus. Jara. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you. No, we love you, and I just, I'm sorry I do it to you all the time, but I just think you do great, and I'm thrilled you're here. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Maxwell, Dr. You forever thank for you. being with us, and of course, Dr. Hibbler, too. Thank Thanks. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Okay, we'll move on now to uh, agenda item uh, 85, a report from Scott D. Adams, our city manager, oh, whose is name is easy to pronounce. <laughs> Thank heavens. Yeah. And he's always at the first of the alphabet. You can't get much further forward. I could tell you all about the family origins of my name, but I was, I'll skip that part <laughs> for my emerging issues report because I, I didn't have an S on the end of my name. But um, Scott Adams, city manager. Um, I just have two quick emerging issues to mention here. The first is, as you know, uh, Shawnee Coleman is unfortunately leaving the city to go to Clark County to become their director of economic development. Uh, you appointed Shawnee to the AB73 committee, which is the committee that was formed out of our homeless legislation that went through the, uh, the legislature this past session. Um, and I, I will serve in her capacity on that committee until such time as we can get uh, an item before you to to uh, formally replace her. I will strongly encourage you to appoint me because I went to the first meeting and the county manager serves on the committee as well as the North Las Vegas city manager. And I think it's gonna be very important as we move through that process and given the importance of homelessness to our city that we have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation in a regional forum 
on homelessness. So um, you, you certainly can appoint whoever you'd like, but I will strongly encourage you to do that so that, that we have the right voice at the table to speak to the other managers within the region on that. May very I suggest issue. that you go ahead and with the, with the concurrence yep. of the city council, serve interimly to fill in for Shawnee Coleman's position on it, but be the, the position, fill it, until you've gone ahead and figured yep. out who's and, and whatever and with your concurrence. And we'll that, do that. I would recommend inter no. interim, um, interimly fill Unfortunately, in. we're not, we're not agenda to take action here, so no. I'll take that as so your advice. So it's an interim yes. yeah, advice. Yep. Okay. The other thing that I want to mention is, and, I, and this is more of a public announcement, again to remind our public that act the public hearing on the encampment ordinance 2019-36 will be on November 6th. I think as we approach that date, it's going to be important to pinpoint as close as we can when that will be taken up on the agenda. I've been contacted by a number of stakeholders, uh, on particular downtown, who would like to appear and, and speak at that meeting, and I and I then have to be a little nebulous about when it might actually be on and be taken up the agenda on the agenda. So. Um, I think uh, that's something that we'll just have to work out as well. If I could on this, that. just knowing how well today went, it may be a little inconvenient for your directors and chief as you figure out how they fit in. But this whole issue of doing the work of our citizens first on the agenda and then hearing reports later on, because this issue, and we've heard in the mayor's office, and I'm sure council has as well. Um, a lot of opinions, and they want to talk about it. In my sense, would be that they would, it it would be trailed, yes, until later in the agenda, maybe after the midday break, and then take the afternoon and let them right. go at and it. Let's take care of citizen business right. and planning, everything else in the morning that requires us and them to sit here. We don't want them sitting through something that is not important to them that has business and it costs right. them money to be here. So my suggestion would be, and it's just, it's not agendized to do this either. Just we'll go ahead if I could ask the um, city clerk to look favorably about having it in the afternoon as you prepare the agenda so that we can be trailing it after city business. In that way we can at least give the uh, those who want to come in appear a ballpark idea of when they should appear and they won't have to sit through the entire meeting. Right. Yep. Right. So and that, that's the end of my emerging issues. Any quite wait, don't go away. Any questions, comments here from council that you might have? Nope, we're good. Oh my goodness. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Okay, and now we go on to DIR seven seven two one four director's business presentation by Department of Planning regarding progress in the Las Vegas downtown master plan, which was accepted by the Planning Commission with a 6-0 vote. And Mr. Summerfield. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the council. With me this afternoon is Michael Howe. He is our section manager for long range planning in the planning department. And him and his team have uh, led the way in a lot of what I'm going to talk about. So he's going to be here to help answer any questions if you have any. Um, so this afternoon, I just want to do a, a quick update progress report on the status of the implementation of um, the 2045 uh, master plan, the Vision 2045 master plan for downtown Las Vegas. This plan is uh, for those of you who were here in 2016, but we've got a lot of new faces, so um, I'll try to give a brief just recap of how we got to where we are today. Um, the downtown master plan um, is a subset of your citywide master plan, so it is uh, specific to our downtown area. Um, it provides guidance and vision for downtown. Um, and then through the work that we do with the zoning, specifically with the implementation that we're working on with form-based code, uh, we implement that vision. Uh, where th So uh, j again, to recap where we, where we got to on this. So uh, now it's been a few years ago, um, back actually in the days when our city manager was the head of economic and urban development here at the city. He was meeting with stakeholders and developers in downtown, trying to recruit new business, new development. And one of the things that he heard um, and resonated with him and, and, and the city manager at the time 
was that we need a vision. We need a coherent thought for what downtown can be, should be, we want it to be. And so it was really uh, under his direction and initiative, uh, then working with the city manager, that began what we called City by Design, and as one of those projects was the downtown master plan. From that downtown master plan, we came up with the five, what we call them, big ideas. And these big ideas help um, create the themes that the master plan works under, uh, diversify the economy, create what we call mixed-use hubs, uh, create streets that are for people, um, create a greener downtown, and finally, expedite implementation because we know time is money, and the sooner that we can get the plan rolling and get development occurring, uh, the, the better it will be for everyone involved. This effort was one that was one of the largest to date public outreach efforts that we've ever taken uh, with a planning process here in the city of Las Vegas. It involved uh, hundreds of interviews, um, so many uh, meetings with the public, and more specifically, meeting the public where they were instead of asking uh, everybody to come to us. We went to them. We went to open houses. We went to neighborhood associations. We went to church groups and, and things like that to talk about what, what we should be doing in downtown. Um, as a result of all of that, downtown expanded, the, what we considered downtown for planning purposes. Um, for those of you who remember the old downtown centennial plan, um, it was the historic core down the strip, and that was kind of it. Kind of it. Um, through this planning effort, we learned that there were a lot more people who considered themselves downtown, um, and there were a lot of other areas that had synergy with all of the efforts and energy that was going into downtown development. And so as a part of the downtown master plan, we added the historic west side district, we added the medical district, and we added what became known as the founders district, um, three areas that previously had not been a part of uh, the downtown planning process. And we're seeing, we're seeing results. We're seeing new residential development. We are seeing new um, opportunities for parking and uh, mixed use development where we're using our parking facilities for more than just parking. They also include retail and office opportunities. And they're catalysts for other development that is coming, like the convention center at World Market, like the, the hotel that is uh, proposed for Parcel B in Symphony Park and other things. Um, these, these planned goals um, center around, uh, when we go back to the plan, uh, sort of a scorecard, a, a goal sheet, if you would. And that goal sheet was pretty ambitious. In 2016, we were still just coming out of the recession. Um, we had a, a pretty well-known um, well economic uh, firm as a part of the team that looked at this. And when they looked at our market and what we could absorb, these were ambitious goals at the time. Some of them, we maybe undersold ourselves, and we, through the efforts of our city management team, through the efforts of this council, and through all the other directors here at the city of Las Vegas, we're actually hitting a number of these targets way, way ahead of time, and so there's a lot to be proud of here. But just to, as a kind of reminder, particularly for those who weren't on the council then, these are uh, the targets that we were hoping to hit. Um, in these, we're talking uh, 60, just under 6,500 new residential units. We're talking uh, more than a million additional square feet in uh, commercial space, uh, new office and R&D uh, locations, and then new civic spaces. And these civic spaces um, include not just things like the new courthouse that we're actually we're building now, but new schools and new other institutional higher education opportunities um, to come to downtown. So here's where, here's where we're kind of at. Um, uh, again, we've done an analysis. We've taken a really hard look at all our entitlement applications that we've received. So we can see what kind of activity has been uh, produced since 2016 when the plan was adopted. And so the plan is just a little over two years old. Uh, so it has not been in place uh, that long. We do have some areas, as I mentioned, that we are we're excelling. We, uh, the, the team here at the city has done tremendous work with the private sector in, in bringing forth uh, quite a bit of projects uh, in this area. So hospitality, we all know what's happening downtown. I think um, Scott has said it best, you know, the crane is the new, the new uh, state bird or city bird because we've got them flying all over and hospitality is where a lot of those cranes are focused right now. We also have a number of residential units. We have 
uh, residential units in Fremont East. We have residentials in Symphony Park. We have uh, residential units in Founders District and, and all over downtown we're seeing an interest in creating places for people to live. Um, I think there's still more work to do in that space, but we have made tremendous uh, inroads into that 6,500-ish um, number. Uh, so a lot of work there. A lot of work in civic space. We have the new courthouse, um, and it's not as if the courthouse is leaving the RJC and that space will be empty. The RJC will repopulate the area that the, the, the municipal court is um, moving out of. So again, we're not just trading one building for another one. So that's uh, a tremendous uh, opportunity. We have the convention center occurring at World Market, which again is a great addition. Some areas that we still have, we still have some focus on. So we have not seen at, at present um, a big absorption in the office market. So while we're seeing a lot of property owners invest in their existing buildings, and that's tremendous and to be applauded, um, in terms of new development or expansions of existing buildings, uh, we do have some uh, awesome examples. We have the Dapper project that's proposed on Las Vegas uh, at the old uh, uh, post office where he's going to be rehabbing that building and expanding onto it and adding new square footage there, which is tremendous. Um, but that's another opportunity is, and I know EUD has been working very hard in looking at partners to bring in new office space. Additionally, uh, retail uh, is another one of those, and as our mixed use projects come to fruition, we'll see more opportunities for, for some of that retail and commercial space. Uh, Education, that is going to be a big one that is going to take a larger conversation for downtown. Uh, many of the schools that service downtown right now are at or over capacity. Um, and as we continue to bring on new residential units and expand our conversation beyond some of the studio and single bedroom um, housing options that we've seen thus far come into the market, and we begin thinking about the idea of people growing their family and living in downtown over the course of their life cycle and not just maybe in their younger years or in their empty nester years, we need to be thinking about what about education and providing uh, opportunities for those children to go to school in the environment in which they live. And then secondary education, we have a tremendous relationship with the local universities um, and continue to build on those partnerships and bring some of the classes um, and uh, opportunities that they provide our community downtown and provide this urban context for some of their learning is also something to continue to work on. This third group is kind of a summary bucket. It's not in the original scorecard, but it's kind of uh, meant to show just how much activity that this council and um, this community are working towards. Um, we have had a tremendous amount of commercial square footage that has been approved and or built in the last couple of years. Uh, mixed use, which is that blend of the residential component with some other commercial or retail component. Um, and then activated ground floor. My team put this number on here because this is vital for the downtown um, mixed use concept to work. The, the way that you get that vibrancy is you create at the pedestrian level things that interest people. They walk by, they window shop, they actually shop, they visit offices, they're doing business, and then they're living above and they're going to restaurants for dinner and what have you. And so that active ground floor retail is a key component of creating that vibrancy um, that the plan calls for. And like I said, there's just so much work that's going. We've had groundbreakings in Symphony Park. We've had the new Muni Court building. We've got the World Market, the Expo Center that is underway. So just tremendous opportunities for new development, and those become catalysts for, for other development going forward. Um, this has been an awesome two years for that, for former members of the council, the work that they did, and then the work that the current council is doing in this regard. So development downtown, so as we, we know, we entitle more than we build. We, we know that there will always be a, a segment of uh, the pop uh, of the development community where there's a lag, where there's uh, projects that get entitled that for whatever market changes may not get built. But right now we're doing um, a tremendous amount of work in this area and a fair amount of um, development that has been entitled is getting built and permits are being pulled 
and dirt is being turned. And so this is a tremendous success uh, for this area. And that last column kind of totals that. Uh, we've entitled approximately uh, five million, uh, five and a half million square feet in, in projects right now. We've got uh, almost uh, two million, 1.75 uh, million square feet that are under construction, that are in permits. And so that's a tremendous thing. And as we heard earlier today, you know, projects, uh, some older projects, they've been around for 11 years. These are projects that have been entitled and really moving today, and, and DIRT is turning on those. But it's not just the development, it's also the business. So uh, under this vision, it calls for a diversification of our economy and growing um, our business. And so here you see the, 20, uh, the top 20 business license categories and the growth in those areas in downtown. Uh, we also are aware, and it, it doesn't make the top 20 because there's only so many of them, but downtown is also um, where uh, half of our marijuana uh, dispensaries have located um, in the downtown area. Um, there's more than 300 new businesses that have located in this area. Um, and that's new, so that's, that's not taking into account all the existing businesses that have expanded some of their operations and other things. These are new businesses. Um, one of the things, though, that the plan um, addresses and one of the things that we're looking at as a measurement tool for success for the city for implementation of the plan is land vacancy. The, the plan identified that we had, particularly for an urban area of our, our size, we had a high vacancy rate in our, in our downtown area. Um, and the vacancy rate is either undeveloped or um, land that maybe had previously been developed but had been wiped clean. This doesn't include our parking lots because uh, as our EUD department will tell you, parking lots are economic um, drivers. They produce income, they provide opportunities for other businesses to be able to, um, to thrive without providing parking for themselves. So this just includes land that is vacant, um, it doesn't include parcels that do have buildings that may not be occupied at the time. But right now, 12%, that is a huge number, um, but it's a huge opportunity uh, for our community to attract new um, and interesting and different um, development opportunities. Mr. Summerfield, uh, go back if you would, just that one. Um, in cities our size and of somewhat comparable business, what's, what should that number be? So I don't have that number right off the top of my head. Ballpark. I apologize. Um, it's somewhere less than 10%. Okay. Um, and a lot of the times that's going to be actually land that's not, in a lot of cases we have land that's never been touched because we've leapfrogged development in a, in a number of areas. Um, but that's going to be land where maybe there was something there in the 50s or 60s, then it went away and may, it hasn't been redeveloped yet. Is it attributable to anything? Is it attributable to the growth in major league sports that has landed in the south part or not? I it's think just... in part it's because for us it's a little bit it's our history. So when we think particularly of the why, people, why businesses went to the strip versus being in the city, our history has played a lot of, um, uh, it's been a big player in why development is been in certain areas and leapfrogged past other other areas. And we're also very young still. You know, as a city, we, compared to some of our peers in terms of size, uh, we've had extreme rapid growth. Um, and so we have, again, leapfrogged a little bit. We've done a lot of things in the suburbs. We've done a lot of things in the other communities that surround us. And so I, I don't think it's been a necessarily a bad thing. I think it's just a, a just product of our history and um, our youth. Okay. But we're maturing, and so that provides a lot of opportunity. Excuse me, almost fell there. Um, current initiatives. So we've got the downtown uh, wayfinding standards. Um, we part of the implementation of the downtown master plan said downtown needs identity, and it needs ways to clearly get from uh, one area, one district to the next, um, and provides that particularly as a tourist destination. And so we've been working very closely amongst the Public Works Department, um, EUD, planning, um, and communications on 
how that wayfinding message goes through. We've uh, developed and adopted standards uh, for how that wayfinding package should work, and uh, your public works department is working very closely with the RTC to make sure that as future roadway projects go in, we're putting those wayfinding components in to help direct uh, people into the downtown. Um, the development uh, process improvements, uh, one of the things, again, and this is Scott and Jorge and Tom's leadership, um, we continuously look at development process improvements. So, uh, and I think you all have had briefings recently to talk about the innovations that have occurred, the things that the city has done and all of the development departments have done to help streamline processes and allow projects to move through the timeline, securing our, our community's interest, but getting those projects out in a more timely fashion. And finally, new development standards. So you see here um, just kind of examples of the different transects. Uh, council unanimously, thank you, earlier today, adopted our second uh, form-based code district for downtown. Um, and just actually as the, uh, the last presentation was going through, I got a text amendment or text message that said the city has won um, an APA Nevada award uh, for uh, best uh, implementation plan, which is our form-based code adoption for the medical district. So uh, this new development standards is providing new opportunities for developers to see what we expect before they invest a lot of money so that they know what, um, what we as a community are looking for and can help collaboratively uh, work with us to get projects out of the ground faster. Wonderful. Uh, current initiatives, so the council has adopted the uh, downtown uh, civic space and trails plan. Um, and you're seeing that come to fruition with the project on 3rd Street. Again, just today you approved uh, one of the elements of a land acquisition for across the street from City Hall, where uh, civic space is one of the components of that uh, ultimate development. And again, working very collaboratively across multiple departments to see that happen. Um, infrastructure investments, uh, the work of Public Works and O&M uh, to make improvements throughout the city and rebuild our streets and maintain our existing streets to to address the the streets for people concept that is in the plan. Um, we're seeing that all over the place. You see that um, Main Street is a great example, the Main Commerce couplet, um, a tremendous opportunity, particularly if you go uh, down into the area in the Arts District where that is at. And then 6th Street is currently under development as well. And Fremont Street, uh, I believe uh, City Attorney Jerbic is going to come up and talk to you here in a moment about the exciting work that's happening in the Fremont Street area around this infrastructure project, again, helping to bolster the goals and objectives and the vision uh, that City Council uh, put forth in the master plan. And with that, Michael and I are here if you have any questions about what we're doing and what's next. It's simply great. It's very exciting to be part of it. and. I envy the fact that all of these council people have more terms ahead of them. We'll watch this happen, and it's just you've done a great job, and fortunately we're out of the abysmal recession and moving forward, and just hope for that. So let's, any uh, comments? Mayor Pro Tem first, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I think you guys are doing a phenomenal job. And as I look at the 12% vacancy um, area and with nationally it being a little less than 10, um, I see that we are growing um, by in a rapid speed downtown. And I just want to make sure, because I know how generous the city is uh, with folks and you know looking at businesses coming in, I just want to make sure that our vacant land, um, as we are growing and, and as people really want to move into the downtown, that we look at fair market value. Oh, good point. Very good point. And I know the reason, I mean, it's because your uh, ward is exploding just like the South is. So you're sucking up all. That's why we're only at 12 percent instead of a 10 <laughs> ranchette living. Yes, Councilman Knudsen, please. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Summerfeld, for the presentation. I, um, I don't think I've talked about this with you, but I've talked about this um, with my constituents um, and especially with the university. Um, in the medical district, because there will be a school of medicine, there's already a school of dental medicine. I think there's hopes and dreams around a nursing school and allied public health schools coming in there. I think there's opportunity in, in 
framing the conversation, especially in a document like this, as a medical district in addition to an education district or uh, maybe a fancier way of saying that, but making sure that education is a focal point in Ward 1 uh, is important to me in addition to the medical district. So I appreciate just your, your thought and consideration about how to memorialize how much learning is happening in Ward 1 with, specific, with specifically to the medical district. Madam Mayor. Yes, please, Scott. Uh, Scott Adams, City Manager, in, in response to what Councilman Knudsen just said, I, I spent quite a bit of time during the master plan process with the economist who did, who, who prepared the underlying economic projections for the plan. And when he found out that there was going to be a medical school downtown, he said you could almost virtually double your projections. Hmm. He said the, that a medical school's impact on a downtown area is profound. So I will, I would tell the councilman that those numbers are robust due to the existence of unknown development and plan build out of a medical school. I just thought I would share that with no, you. No, I think that's critical. It's critically important and certainly to put in your bag knowing of the future. And as we look at the expansion of the Cleveland Clinic, LaRuvo Institute for Brain Health, and the potential of other uh, medical groups coming into the heart of downtown and certainly into your ward, um, it really boasts well of a great future. Just hopeful that it continues to grow and that we support the right things going forward. So it is an exciting time. So hopefully you get two more terms. Anyway, uh, we thank you. And uh, any questions, um, Councilwoman? Okay, we're good. Thank you very, okay, very much. You. Appreciate it, Mr. Howe. Okay, and we are now, I hope the energy continues here. We have a report from our wonderful Brad Jerbic, who did such a great job this morning. It was so uh, a very foggy mess this morning that had great clarity brought through your historic review of what we were looking at. You really did a superior job. I mean, I was really pulled uh, in different directions, and especially by phone calls, people stopping me and voicing their opinions. But hearing you, you just made it so clear. So anyway, we're not on that right now, even though you are our city attorney, but it's on the progress and future plans of Project Enchilada, the all-encompassing project to revitalize downtown Las Vegas, wards one and three. Uh, Councilman Knudsen and Diaz, and um, how did you get the name Enchilada? Where, where did that come from, Mr. Well, Jerbeck? One it, it, day it was there, and the day story. before it hadn't been. The, um, in, in noodling around with the idea, um, I was thinking that downtown has got everything we need to have a vibrant city. It just hasn't all been put together. And so the idea was, let's make the whole enchilada. And uh, it's funny because I showed it to my brother, Tom Perigo, and I actually took off Project Enchilada and I put Project X on it. And Tom took off the X and put on Project Enchilada. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's been the way it's been ever since. Well, so. and I know too the spirit of this all, and maybe you were planning it before, but I'll bet you not, 1 October 2017 and the Healing Garden and all that you both did working with Jay and everyone else, um, that what you can do with street stapes, streetscapes and gardens and beauty. I mean, I somehow felt that the enchilada came out of that, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, it was just, just it one just of those just out, out of nowhere. I don't know where, but it stuck. Uh, okay. If I could, Jeff, I just received word from my videographer that the new Vimeo is ready. It's under the same code. He says you just have to reload the page. So cool. So I'll signal Jeff when it's time to play it. I got a couple of things to surprise you with today. Hopefully a couple of good updates for you today. Um, as you know, um, thanks to our manager, uh, number one, uh, we're able to put this project together. And this really is as cross-departmental as it comes. Uh, Mike Howe has been our leader in planning. Randy McConnell has been our leader in public works. But over them, of course, is Jorge and Tom Perigo. And, and this would not be happening if it weren't for this multi-departmental approach to, to, the, to the project. Uh, and I got to tell you, I've learned an awful lot. Uh, and, uh, and I've annoyed an awful lot of people, too, in the process. But uh, let's, let me tell you just briefly where we started. The, the concept was to bite off an entire area of Las Vegas, and I'll get to that at the very end, 
um, but to be about, about 12 square miles downtown. And that would be from I-15 to Eastern, from US-95 to Charleston, taking in the Arts District and taking in the Huntridge Theater and the Huntridge Circle Park. And so with that, we started with phase one. And we started with a phase one downtown on Fremont Street, which you're gonna see the progress report on. It goes from Las Vegas Boulevard all the way to 14th Street. And the reason we picked that for phase one is because we have one significant owner that owns almost all the property in that area, and that's Tony Shea and his company, Downtown Projects. And so uh, in, the, in working with them, this has been a very collaborative effort. The responsibility of the city has been the design and installation of new sidewalks in some areas, installation of trees, which you're going to see, installation of special street lights for special districts, which you're going to see, and traditional things that city do. The downtown project's responsibility is to take all of their old motels and on their dime, resurface the parking lots, repaint the buildings, bring them back to the condition as if they were new. And the responsibility of the Centennial Commission, after they gave us three, hundred, three quarters of a million dollars, was to redo every neon sign for those seven motels. One of them you're gonna see today, one of them gets installed next week, and we work on the next five starting next month. So, so we've already made a lot of progress and two motels have been completely repainted and repaved. The project started on October 7th, and October 7th, the Las Vegas Paving Corporation, the city's contractor, started at two ends. On Maryland Parkway, working west, they're putting in storm drains right now, and they're dewatering, so that's under construction. And at the same time, they've already started the portion that you're gonna see a video of in a moment. You're gonna see a 3D model of that portion of the project between Las Vegas Boulevard and 6th Street. So a couple, a couple of interesting stories that I could tell before we run the first video that I'm gonna show you. The, um, the city fortunately approved uh, two sets of contracts, one with Civic Visions, there are consultants from Harvard that have been working with us on the cultural authenticity of the project and the architecture. And what they have done to make this an authentic project, I cannot tell you. I literally get calls sometimes in the middle of the night, can you get me another picture of the 1929 street light because I'm not sure how many flowers were on the side of it. That's the level of detail we're going into, into the project. Then we have Midge and Kelly with, with their project, their company, Downtown Works. They're urban retail specialists and they are working with Councilman Creer on a project in West Las Vegas, a retail project as well as development, and they're working with the city of Las Vegas on Enchilada and the Arts District and East Fremont Street, and that's bringing specialized urban retail to Las Vegas. We've already had some significant developers and significant designers come here that are highly interested right now in getting on the ground in Las Vegas and getting involved in our downtown project. And they've actually reached out to the property owners and told them that they are interested. Without going into detail, some are even interested in talking about the old motels being motels again. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're aware, Wouldn't but around nice? the country, mid-century modern motels are on fire right now. Uh, you see in Paul Springs, the Aces Motel is just a shining example of what you can do with one of these old structures. And in Austin, Texas, uh, the San Jose uh, Hotel is another example. They're getting $400 a night to stay in a mid-century modern building. So we really think that we might be onto something here. We really think there may be a market for it, but uh, that's the pieces of the puzzle. So what I wanna show you first, with your permission, if you're ready, Jeff, let's show the video. So I have a videographer from Los Angeles his name is John Moody. Uh, he did an award-winning video on the rebuilding of Pershing Square, and he has done a test video for us on the enchilada. And Jeff, if you'd roll it now, that'd be great.
Firstly, that is a draft that's not for rebroadcast or publication. Uh, we need to get some waivers from some people, but you heard your Honor's voice on there. You heard Jack Binion. You heard uh, Senator Richard Bryan. You heard Bob Stoldall. Uh, when, he, when you heard the, uh, we used to hang out here, uh, Bob told many stories about the old days that uh, I remember, and I'm sure uh, Councilman Krim may remember, too, the end of it, the cruising on Fremont Street on, uh, on Friday and Saturday nights. You, you know, uh, I... As I, I, you know this, you know, I purchased my wedding rings from his brother at their jewelry store right on Fremont Street and 25 years ago. Wow. And so uh, I, I definitely know the business. Your brother was kind enough to actually finance me <laughs> because I didn't have all the money. But uh, that was what Vegas was all about, right? I Absolutely. went in there with a friend of mine who knew... Uh, where everybody went down to the jewelry store to, 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 to patronize you guys. That's where you went. And a friend of mine went with me, and he vouched for me, and he said, this guy's a good guy. He'll pay you back. Your brother said, will you pay me back? I said, yeah. He goes, okay. Here goes the ring. That's and that's it. what it was. And I got a little receipt. And I remember I still have the receipt. It's a, and it was right when you wrote out the receipt. It was a pad, you know, and I got, mm -hmm. the, I got the carbon yellow copy of it. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, you, you, you're preaching to the choir, man. That's a great story. That's a great story. Yeah. We remember high school days uh, cruising Fremont. Uh, after it became one way, it was a little more boring. Yeah. But when it was two way, it was a lot more fun. Uh, Bob Stolwell can remember a, 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 a restaurant called The Sills later became the tip top on the corner of Charleston and Las Vegas Boulevard. Big round restaurant that everybody gathered at afterwards as well. But I could go on and on, not to, not to bore you with stories, but downtown was the center of Las Vegas. It was the center of retail. It was the center of the casino industry. It was the center of life. All the Centel employees, remember Centel, Central Telephone Company, before we got CenturyLink, they, all the workers were downtown. And at noon, when they let out, they flooded the streets and shopped and ate. The police department was downtown, lawyers, judges, everybody. And, and so after the Boulevard Mall opened, you began to see that attrition. And then we got to the point where we're at now. Well, I really believe, and I think most people believe, that the real authentic urban experience is back. People want genuine. They want authenticity. We get stopped right now, and you'll see it as I go through the PowerPoint. As people have seen these motels painted and see the lights on, they want to know when it's going to open so they can get a room. This is what's going on. And people are eating downtown again, and they're shopping downtown again. And I think it's just the beginning of it. So with that, what I would like to do is go through uh, the PowerPoint and give you a little hint of you know, what we've done so far. This is the uh, today's update. This, if you haven't seen it before, most of you have. This is the enchilada. This is the boundary I told you, I-15 to Eastern, US-95 to Charleston. And you see the little part that goes down by the Huntridge and the part that goes into the Arts District. This is phase one. Uh, which uh, we're giving each phase a name. So phase one is called Mackey's Back, and you'll see why in a little bit. But this uh, yellow area is Las Vegas Boulevard, Fremont Street, down to 14th Street. Let me say that I call it phase one because this is a multi-phase project, and we're already on to phase two. So this is phase two. So phase one in yellow is uh, Fremont Street, that portion of it anyway, the Huntridge Theater and Huntridge Circle Park. And then in phase two, I've already talked to Councilwoman Diaz and with her liaison, Ido, we had our first neighborhood meeting with the Mayfair District, which is a large area you see next to the first phase, to talk about a neighborhood project there. And then you see what I would like to do on the second phase is East Fremont from Eastern all the way up to Bruce. That's another area with these classic old motels and the original neon signs. Let me stop right here and let you know that I'm gonna go through the uh, Fremont uh, phase right now as we show you what, where we're at with the construction and with the paint jobs. I will tell you, Huntridge Circle Park uh, is already in the process of conversion. About 20% of it has been made a children's park by the city council. It's already fenced off. And Jay Dapper is raising about $100,000 for specialized children's equipment for it. And I think he showed it to you in one presentation earlier. I've seen the most recent version. I want to go play on it. It's really cool stuff. The other part is the other 80% is going to be an outdoor sculpture garden with no eating, sitting, anything in it. And so there will not be a, a problem with maintaining that park. And one of the things that I want to surprise you with today is that other little square there is the uh, Huntridge Theater. About one hour ago, I have a signed copy of the purchase and sale agreement to buy the Huntridge Theater. And it'll be on your agenda on November 6th. 
So, so we got, I, we, we, I think I called Jay Dapper today. He's going to be our assignee and our developer for the project. We'll bring the whole thing to you on November 6th. We're not allowed to talk about it today, but because it's part of the enchilada, I thought it would be a good idea to give you what your appetite with what's coming in two weeks. So you can't tell us what you're going to do with it today? Well, I, I'll give you a, a little hint. Um, <laughs> it will not probably be a movie theater, but it likely will be a performing uh, theater of, of, of a different kind. I'll brief you confidentially what Jay has in mind and some of the developers he's talked to. I, I think they're game changers for Las Vegas. And so that's all I can say. I bought my first yo-yo there. You did? At the movie theater. They used to have the, uh, the yo-yo company used to, in between movies, do, used to demonstrations of yo-yos. That's so outstanding. They were on the stage there, and it was, you know, they're showing the yo-yos doing all the tricks and everything. He said, I got to add one of those. So it came back the next time. I, I, maybe not the next time, because I, I never had any money, but we figured it out, and I got a yo-yo. I, I, I bought my first yo-yo. I love it. The, it's funny. Oh, yeah. uh, people like Council McCreary and myself, that people grew up here, remember that, and we have fond memories. I remember my parents dropping us off on weekends for the matinees, and they have uh -huh. a double billing. And the Fox uh, Theater is right down the street. And, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, look, we can go on and on. But I tell you, uh, whew, spent some good times at the Huntridge, man. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, they're coming back. They're coming back. So anyway, I wanted to show you today, for the first time, we have a signed purchase and sale agreement. And, and so um, we'll be talking about that more, and I'll be giving Mr. Rugelman a lot of information in the next couple of weeks. So having said that, um, let's talk about the project. Again, it's streets. Mm, it's landscaping for the streets. It's restoration of the motels and two gas stations and the neon signs. So what I've done in this PowerPoint, unlike the PowerPoints you've seen before, is I've cut out the stuff that we were going to do. I'm just going to show you the stuff we are doing that is in the ground now. So this is the Traveler's Motel. It's on the corner of 11th and Fremont. And that's what it looked like in 2006. These are all Google photos. The, uh, you can see it had its landscaping. It was still open. The sign was still intact. This is what it was in 2019. So this is it this year. This was it three months ago. Uh, the sign is destroyed. It's all boarded up. It's been broken into. It's fenced off. The landscaping's dead. And here it is today. It's yeah. been completely re landscaped, repainted, redone. The sign has all uh, been redone from top to bottom. It's all original neon. That little bit in that video you saw with the guy with the, with the glass tube in his hand with the flame, he was making the neon tubes for these signs. So we've got all the video of that. That yellow blob up above the driveway that you walk in, there's a sign that goes there that's finished. They just didn't have time to install it before I took the picture. So that'll be put in. This is the courtyard of the Travelers when it was still alive. And here it is today. Hmm. All new lights, all new everything, all new surfacing. Like I say, people drive by and they think this is open. The Lucky Motel next door is the second one we did. We did a whole block all at one time. This is the Lucky when it was open, one version of the Lucky when it was open. And one of the things you can tell, and I always point this out to people, look in particular at the trees in all of these photos. Yeah. This is how people kept cool back then, before they had central air conditioning. They had trees and fans. This is the Lucky Hotel today, all repainted. That parking lot wasn't refinished at the time we took the picture, so there it is now. It was just repaved last weekend. And they're going to stripe it in the whole bit. So you can see the old pool has been redone. That's not water. That's blue astroturf. We can't put water in because it's just unsafe. But uh, pretty soon you're going to see various things out on that pool. One of the things they're going to do is they're going to cut mannequins in half, yeah. paint them up like people, put inner tubes around them, and float them in the pool. <laughs> and so you can imagine what you can do with this. Santa Claus in there at Christmas time, uh, zombies in there at Halloween time. You know, you can have a lot of fun with this. Are, so, are these motels, though, safe? Were the owner ready to open them? Are they, you know, uh, fume-wise and everything else, uh, asbestos, whatever, are they safe for occupancy? They're, they're not safe for occupancy for a couple of reasons. One, in the inside, the, the air conditioners are all gone. They're all rotted. Uh, some of them, the floors are a bit rotted. Uh, the plumbing was stripped out by street people downtown over time. So you, copper pipes and wiring and things like that would all have to be redone. In fact, that one of the reasons we turned the water on on the outside but not the inside was we just didn't want one of the rooms to flood. But they could be. The only asbestos in there that we're aware of is in the caulking for the glass pane windows. 
and it's a very safe kind of asbestos to remove. It's not, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't float in the air so you can inhale it. So it's, it's very easily removed and remediated. So, so we have think they been costed out estimate wise to re Furbish the insides of the motel to make them uh, we, we have not. We have not, but I do have a commitment from Downtown Projects. We are taking the lobbies of these motels and we are fixing them up. So I've already asked them to, excuse me, gut the lobby of the Lucky and gut the lobby of the Travelers. And then we'll go in and we'll put in new power supply, we'll put in uh, new overhead lighting, we'll put in refrigerators, we'll put in air conditioners, and then we'll turn them over to the police department and or our marshals to be used as many police precincts. Brilliant. So now people don't have to drive a police car up and down the street, or if you're walking up and down the street, 115, a police officer with all the accoutrements on, that is pretty brutal. But now they'll have one or two places on each block Great where idea. they can use their computers, file reports, things Great like that. Idea. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, these, by the way, these are all the original colors. Our folks came out and scraped all the buildings right down to the original, matched up and had them painted. So there's the lucky before original, here it is today. That's another older one. And that's it from the same angle. And on that same pole, the original sign that you just saw in that picture will be reinstalled. So let's talk about look at one more of the lucky signs currently. So signs are really critical here. One of the things that we believe is that neon downtown is, is a real uh, a real attraction. People come to town and they want to see the old neon, and you don't get it on the strip. It doesn't exist anymore, but we have it, and it's all coming back. So these are all original signs downtown as they appear today. And these are those signs restored. So the Alicia sign is originally the star view, and that one is going to get full treatment here in the next couple of months, and it'll be relit. The Travelers, when we showed this, we didn't know that the original color was that green. The original color is leprechaun green, so we have pictures of this completely being restored. Mm -hmm. They came in, repainted everything. And then about four weeks ago, we flipped a switch just before life is beautiful and lit it up. And that's when the cars started stopping and asking us when they could rent a room. Just amazing. Do we have that hanging person on the new one? Pardon? That hanging person? On yes, the we do. We do. Uh, they, uh, uh, Downtown Projects bought a number of these mannequins that look like a climbing person, and they put them on everything. And they wanted it reattached when we did it, and we said, no problem. So, uh, and are you using LED lights so it's less costly to maintain or no? Yes, well, the, on the bulbs themselves, the bulbs themselves are LED because you can't tell them from incandescent, but the neon is not LED, it is authentic neon. They're hand forming the glass tubes, filling them with the colored neon, matching it up. And what's a life, uh, life of one of those? Are you, I mean, so are you yeah. building more than one of them so they can be replaced and you kept know, up? It's funny. I, I learned a lot about neon during this. What you do is you trace, let's see where it says travelers, and you see that's all in neon. Yeah. They trace that, and they take this paper with the exact lettering, and then they start forming the tubing, and they lay it on the paper and, and exactly fit it. You'd be amazed what an art this is. Wow. And so they can remake any of this literally in a day. And so uh, the neon lasts a very long time. The LEDs last even longer. The thing that will not last as long is the paint. So about every three or four years, they're going to need a touch up on the paint. So let's go to this one. This is the great story. This is the um, Valley Motel sign, and it's missing. And we thought we had to rebuild it. And that lucky sign that you saw before is missing, and we thought we had to rebuild it. And so we accidentally got a picture of the lucky sign on the ground, and we realized somebody had plucked it and kept it. And with that picture, we went on a treasure hunt, and we found the lot where it was stored. And then we found who controlled the lot. And the lot was controlled by a magician that performed here in Las Vegas named Steve Weirich. And so I went online and Googled him, and up came an article in the Las Vegas Sun about how he collected neon signs, and there was a picture of that sign. This is the picture that was in the Sun newspaper. That's it on his living room wall. So I sent him an email and said, I'll fly you to Vegas on our dime. I want to talk about your signs. And he came, and he donated them both back to the city of Las Vegas. So here is the lucky sign as it appeared with some burned out neon, but that's what it was on the ground. And here it is today that we have that, we possess that. It's at the sign shop now getting repainted and re-neoned, and it'll be installed next week. Hey, Brett. Mm -hmm. Brett. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's only one speaker. <laughs> I can't hear anything. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. You know, it'd be neat to, since we have our neon museum, mm -hmm. uh, and you're restoring all of these signs 
like if to find a way to incorporate, and this is just sort of talking out loud, incorporate them into the process mm -hmm. or sort of like maybe if there is a authentication, authentication that the Neon Museum could, you know, sort of give a stamp to show that these are authentic signs that have been recreated or something like, you know what I mean? Right. Kind of incorporate them and, and, and because they have, there, there are really our, our bearers of neon and bearers of all the old signs. And if they sort of lent their, like their you know, we, we think so much alike. Uh, the first person I reached out to was Rob McCoy at the yeah. Neon Museum. Yeah. And, and we'd had a second talk. Uh, I hadn't thought about what you thought. I think it's a great idea. What we were thinking is a cooperative agreement. And we are long away yeah. from, from that right now. But it would be wonderful uh, to be able to have an exchange program, maybe. Something. Uh, yeah, I don't fix know. things, display them, and the like. And, and so we're going to continue to pursue that conversation. But I like the idea of the authenticity. Yeah, it'd be kind of good to have a have a stamp and then maybe I don't know maybe even they can display images of them mm -hmm. at the museum in some way shape or form and sort of work hand in hand with each other so we're somewhat driving you know the people because the people coming down to the to the Neon Museum will have an interest if they're at the Neon Museum looking mm -hmm. at that they're going to have an interest with what's yep. going on in Fremont Street and Fremont Street East and and, and vice versa. I agree, and I think what we're going to do for free without even, you know, uh, we're just going to give it to them on every one of the signs that'll say, if you like what you see here, visit the Neon Sign yeah. Museum. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we'll cross-promote you know, it. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd love to talk more about that. So let's talk about streetlights for a moment. Yeah, um, the uh, 1929 was the first year Las Vegas got streetlights, and these are the original Review Journal newspaper articles from 1929. On the left is February of 1929. In the middle is June of 1929, on the end is November of 1929. So the first article, they want them. The second article, they fund them. The third article, they install them. And this is what they installed. That is the original 1929 Las Vegas street light on Fremont Street. Uh, these were massive concrete street lights. Uh, they were meant to send a signal. They were built by the same people that built the street lights in LA in 1929, and designed by the same guy who designed the LA street lights. This is a picture of them on Fremont Street as you're walking um, uh, uh, towards Sunrise Mountain going down the street. This, well, let me back up a minute here, give a little more dramatic effect. We couldn't find them anywhere. We looked high and low to see if we could find a 1929 street light in nowhere. And one day, I'm giving a tour to Mike Mullen of Nevada Hand, and I'm on the west side, and I got lost, and I'm on Revere and Blankenship, Councilman, and I stopped the car, and right there is the original 1929 street light pole in front of a church. It had been moved. It was all alone, had no headpiece, but that is the last of the 1929 poles. So now we have huh. one piece that we can make a mold from. We didn't have the headpiece, so our Harvard people went looking. When they found out the LA connection, they started looking in LA, and they found this. That's the original headpiece, and it happens to be in Hancock Park in Los Angeles. In April of this year, the city of Los Angeles gave that to me to make a mold of. They took it down. There's only three left. They took it down. We shipped it to Pennsylvania, and they're remaking that headpiece right now. Unbelievable. So those streetlights will go from Las Vegas Boulevard to 8th Street, and eventually from Stewart to Bridger. That's 12 square blocks. That'll look like an old town with those street lights. The rest of it, the recommendation is to treat it with these street lights, which you've already seen downtown. We call them the hair dryer lights because they look like a 1960s hair dryer you might sit under. The, uh, the Public Works has restored a number of them with LEDs and new glass globes, and they're gorgeous. And this is what they used to look like when they were on Fremont Street. So they'll be coming back. And the final uh, slide I have is Streetscape. Uh, one of the things, and I got tons of articles that people sent me as we were putting the project together, trees do mean business. When you have to walk, you're not now in a mall, you're not now in downtown Summerlin, you're in a really hot, urban environment, and you have to go from place to place, trees are what get you there. They shade it, they make it comfortable, and they add beauty. And so the city of Las Vegas has invested significantly in very, very large specimen trees. I'm only going to show you one of them, but in March of this year, our city arborists and others went down to Houston, Texas, and got 105 of these. That's magnificent. So they'll be in the ground. How we'll old be are those? 
Pardon? How old? I don't know how old, to be honest with you. Nobody's ever asked me that question. I know how old they are. I know that um, that's a Schumart oak. They picked four different kinds of oak trees, and those will be going in the ground before December 1st on that part of Fremont between Las Vegas Board and 6th Street. And, of course, you alerted Jerry Walker that operations and maintenance, when those leaves fall up, need big-time cleanup of dead leaves. I've avoided that conversation so far. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, Your, Your, Honor, Your Honor, just real quick, I would just ask Mike Howe, who was actually down there in Houston as well, he said those trees are three years old. How old, three? 30, 30. 30 years old. Oh, 30. I was going to say, wow, beautiful. Aren't they are they? magnificent. So it, it's a game changer. So with that, uh, I would like to show you the PowerPoint, and I'll let you know uh, why Mackie's back. Beautiful. Well, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Timeline. Timeline, it started October 7th. My uh, understanding is without change orders, it'll be done May or June. Is that about right? That's about right. That's May or June. And awesome. that's all the way down to 14th Street. And how about I know the Centennial gave a grant. Um, how else is it funding? Is Tony Shea um, other than giving, leasing, lending, charging for? No, he's, he's running a check to, for, for all the motels yeah, and all the awesome. restoration that you see going on there right now. So, so you get an estimate of what it's costing you per block as you go and take on more and more areas? I, I could. I, I know, and I'm going to give a rough number. I think 15 million was what I heard. Somewhere around there for, I look at Jorge because 
uh, for the record, Jorge Cervantes, that, that's true, but Mary, it was just not just the streetscape, we also had to go into a lot of the utility work, so a lot of that was the water lines, the sewer lines had to be done. Typically, the blocks we're doing downtown with the streetscapes, our cost is about a million dollars a mile. And so this one was more because of all the water and sewer utilities we had to replace part of the project. Taking advantage that we're tearing up the road, we're replacing the infrastructure underground, but the streetscape portions rent about a million dollars a mile. And so I'm sorry, a block, you, a million dollars a block. As you look to the future and what's gonna be next on this is number one, number two, mm -hmm. number three, um, is that out of general fund? Is it set aside public works funds? Where, where how, how does this lay out financially? So, Mayor, this qualifies under the motor vehicle fuel tax, so we use Regional Transportation Commission funding to do that, and so that's what we're paying for all this. Awesome. It's well, amazing. tell us the, uh, when to celebrate whoever we're to celebrate and thank them for their participation and continued support as we go forward. Uh, we have so many partners in this, and you can start mentioning, you always see somebody at RTC uh, is doing funding. Uh, we've got, I gotta tell you, our city has just been, everybody that I, I've worked with has just been incredible. But it, it, this really is a group effort. And it's not just a group effort inside the city, it, it's the people outside too that are just flocking to it right now. And, and that's been really great to see, so. Well, it's obviously a public-private partnership of magnitude and of braggadocia. I mean, that everybody in different cities that has this opportunity, perhaps, to find out how you went about it. I hope you're documenting it and writing a book. Well, I'm not writing a book, but I got somebody who will. There's a fellow named Alan Hess, who's the number one expert in the United States on mid-century modern architecture. And I've known Alan for 18 years. He's been here a lot, and I have already got him very interested in a book. We got details to work out. But he does mid-century modern week in Palm Springs every year where they think they have mid-century modern motels, wait till we get done with ours. Uh, we will have more than they have, and they'll be 100%. So I, th I think there is a story there. And how do you project your um, consulting costs and things like that? How, how do we pay for it, or how much do I think it is? Well, uh, both. Okay, I think right now we're a little over 600, 700,000 into consulting costs for two years. That's uh, Civic Visions, that's Downtown Works, that's experts that we've flown in, you know, separate from those contracts. That's uh, trips that we've taken to look at other development in other cities, and, and, and that'll continue to, to grow. It'll be a year-by-year -year decision that the management will make, uh, but I think if they continue to produce, we'll continue to recommend them. But, uh, and that comes out of, all, some comes out of RDA funds, and some is coming out of other city funds, and maybe we're printing it. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> so. Wonderful. Congratulations to oh. everybody that's been involved in the planning of it. Incredible. We well, just you. can't wait. Yeah, Any comments, questions? Yes, Councilman Knudsen. Very briefly, Mayor and Brad, thanks for the presentation. I rode around with you a year and a half, two years ago, um, um, and learned a little bit more about Project Enchilada. I would say, as being a working for several cities as an employee, working for a state as an employee, what you've been able to do is in incredible to bring people to the table and move something forward. And it takes an enormous amount of passion to get a lot of city departments together to do something and then to bring in the private sector as well. So uh, your dedication and passion to something is something that this entire, should ex entire city should examine because all employees, if they de demonstrate that level of passion, you can move mountains in this city because there's such amazing things going on. So thank you for being passionate about the community. No, thank you. And thank you, Scott and Hori and, and everybody for funding it. <laughs> so. No, it is wonderful, and I must say that about three years ago, um, you know, he's been a lawyer for us for a long, long, long time, as well as in private practice, and he got a whole new life and a whole new energy and a whole new spirit that, uh, fun, you're having fun again. I am. I mean, you can see it, so beautiful. Councilwoman. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I just want to say that you really are a true Las Vegan. You love the city, um, and you're bringing the best back, um, what you remember and what you want to see for future generations to enjoy as well. And bringing all of the historical elements back to life is a super cool thing that I can't wait for the future generations to get to witness, because I know I don't remember. I see all those old pictures flashing of Fremont, and when I was growing up, I, I don't remember those images. So it's kind of, it's mind-blowing how we can um, 
kind of bring the best back to uh, a place that um, is so deserving. I think our downtown is amazing. And um, in that vein, Mr. Derbick, I have received questions from some business owners about the placement of some things mm -hmm. along the sidewalks and how they would want one closer here or there. Where should they take these? I guess request to who can they contact about uh, wherever point. the lighting fixtures will go if they're not going to get one how I don't know they're just wanting to know who can they talk to well, the, the project manager from the public works side is Randy McConnell but I would have them call me and here's why um, I kind of filter that before I call Randy mm -hmm. some of it I can answer so quickly and it does it takes the burden off of him because he's in the middle of the project right now uh, but I will tell you before this started you will not believe the number of meetings we've had I've been to every Fremont East Entertainment District board meeting with the exception of one in the last year. I've worked with them on placement of everything in their portion of the project. Uh, we've worked with the Downtown Alliance. We've worked in, I, I mean, we go door to door and walk with people and talk with them. But there'll still be things that come up in the middle. So start with me. And if I think it's a public works question, then I'll forward it to Randy. And then my office will be um, joining forces in your work. I know the, May the Mayfair community um, is excited about the opportunity of beautification extending its way into that beautiful neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so we'll continue that conversation and hopefully we can get um, that extended, that beauty and that vision extended into the neighborhood that's been love there. It. I would love it. Thank you. Thank you. And whatever we um, can do from the council to help get the motels operative with the whatever mm -hmm. it would take to me, I, I do see um, just the, un what's happened with bread and be breakfasts around mm -hmm. the country, but mm -hmm. this is so special. And if those could be occupied, motel rooms, hotels, whatever they are, what an experience. Mm -hmm. they, 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 like I say, they're privately owned. It'll be a DTP decision what to do with them. But in the meantime, the immediate activation that you will see will be food trucks in the parking lots, car rallies in the parking lots. You'll see, uh, hopefully next year at Halloween, ha haunted motels up and down Fremont Street with a different theme at each one. You'll see parades back in certain areas downtown that we haven't had before. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that will go on without turning, opening a single door in a single room. So we, we plan to very much activate well, and them and that take the fences I, Hopefully, down. as you work with um, wh whoever's going to be doing the public um, marketing and mm -hmm. everything that is festivals are planned, mm -hmm. that will become lasting as old days, Hell Dorado, that got its own spirit, that those will be things carefully planned but befitting old Las Vegas and Absolutely. the enchilada. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. Just thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is a report, so no action needed. And we move on to set the date of any appeals filed or required public hearing. So I instruct the city clerk to set the public hearing dates and appeals from the city planning commission meetings and dangerous buildings or nuisance litter abatements, please. Thank you, will do. Thank you. And now we will move into our second and final citizen participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the City Council. No subject may be acted upon by the City Council unless the subject is on the agenda and scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, please come to the podium, give your name for the record. The amount of discussion on any single subject as well as the amount any single speakers allow will be limited. This is your opportunity to address the council, but again, the council will not respond or engage in dialogue. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak under this portion of the agenda? And again, we'll set it at two minutes. Oh, hi. Two minutes, please. Wow. Um, okay, I have a handout that I'd, I'd like to be passed That's around. That's not part of your two minutes, and Ms. Okay. Campbell will come get them from me. Uh, I'm going to back up to the... the Item number 50, where we were talking about weapons, I think you should consider leaving, putting it in parentheses, guns, knives, what, you know, all sorts of weapons, not just guns. So uh, this flyer here. And your name again, please, sorry for the record. What's that? Your name for the record, oh, please. Uh, Daniel Braston, resident. Uh, this flyer here covers Startup Weekend, and uh, that's November 1st and November 3rd, and that's going to be held at the Work in Progress. 
I hope you'll take a look at it. I know you don't have time to go to the whole thing, but consider coming just on Sunday night. I'm not sponsoring it. Thank you. Uh, also on the sheet is information about uh, CES. Now, you're, you're, you're talking about helping children and all that money to put on children, but if we can get parents to go to some of these conventions, and many of them are free, then the parent would bring home a whole new insight to the family dinner table. Um, I have the information on that. How many of you are getting John Lobb's email? So consider that. I have that entry there. He puts out an email that comes out every Sunday night, five weeks in advance. He'll list your activities for free and uh, go from there. Um, three meetings ago, I brought up the idea to make uh, public uh, computer labs, make them accessible after hours. And I've been getting some great help from Sarah, from Mr. Adams' office. We're working on that. We'll have a proposal on that before November 6th. I did mention the challenge I had with this, the message system, and someone was supposed to talk to me about that, and I haven't heard who to talk to about that. I brought up the defaced uh, crossing button signs, hoping they would be done and fixed before life is beautiful, and they're still ugly and out there. So if they're so ugly, let's at least take them down. It shouldn't be hard to print it, because the artwork has already been approved, so that should be an easy way to put a decal up. See, we're talking about building Las Vegas, and it's dirty. It's ugly downtown. Um, for example, at the at Neonopolis, I know that's a private situation now, but we have a bus stop there, and the light isn't working, and it's dirty. And that, these are bus stops, and this is where people get off and get the first impression or lasting impression before they leave our city. I think that should be a focus. Is that my time? Sadly so, but what I would recommend you do is give that list to our city clerk who can make sure to give it to uh, Mr. Cervantes who can direct the suggestions to the right department if that's all right. Community development. And if you have anything else, no, see, I've Cer discussed. see Cervantes, I mean, with your suggestions, which we always want to respond to and, and hopefully can use some of them. So uh, Mr. Cervantes really is property development and all of that. Okay. One, one item, we had a great meeting this uh, last week, and you spoke at it, but that cafeteria is a bad place to have a meeting. That screen is translucent. So at 9 a.m. in the morning, you can't see the image on the screen and paint it black. Okay. You can't hear because of the ice machines. There should be a curtain in front of that. Uh, the individual that was supervising that air didn't know how to turn the microphone on. And it's a switch way on the bottom. You have to get on your knees, so there should be a label at the top. Okay. That well, patio, we'll, the we'll lights won't work. this on. So if you'll do that, thank you, Ms. Campbell, if you will get that. And anyone else wishing to speak under this public comment time? Okay, I'm going to close it, and we are now going to move on to, which we just did, I think our very last item is uh, council commentary. But since I closed this, council member participation, which I'm sure there's a perfect commentary. Council member recognition comments made by individual city council members during this portion of the agenda will not be acted upon by city council unless the subject's on the agenda and scheduled for action. So we'll start with the birthday lady. Thank you. Thank, um, I want to thank my team and everybody here and all my colleagues for the wonderful birthday wishes and especially for the birthday confetti all over my desk. It is really, really cute. Um, so we have upcoming events in Ward 2, Dive-In Movie Night, Saturday, October 26th at 7.30 at the Pavilion Pool on, at, on Pavilion Center Drive. Those are so fun and so popular. And then we have something that I encourage people to come out for. It's a marijuana dispensary meeting. Someone has applied in the ward, and I would like you to come Wednesday, October 30th, 2019, this, this, this October 30th at 5.30, to the West Sahara Library at 9600 West Sahara in the glass room. And please give your opinion, whether you propose or oppose, we would like to know. 
And then if you have a small business in Ward 2, I would love to come out and film you. So you just need to uh, email us at Ward 2 at LasVegasNevada.gov or call us at 702-229-2420 and we will feature your small business. We're looking forward to meeting you. Thank you, and Councilman Greer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, join me, Clark County Commissioner and Clark County Commission Lawrence Weekly, and graduate students for the School of Public Policy and Leadership for Resources Fair. Uh, this event will take place on Wednesday, October 23rd from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Pearson Community Center, located at 1625 West Cary Avenue. There will be vendors offering services to discuss resumes, skill training, drop, job placement, meals and housing assistance, and more. Also, Nevada colleges will be on site to discuss the enrollment process. All families are welcome. On Thursday, October 24th, 5.30 to 8 p.m., I'll host an event along with city staff to discuss community manners and issues of importance to Ward 5. The community form update residents on the top Ward 5 strategic priorities, the Ward 5 works program, homeless courtyard, homelessness, and housing, historic urban neighborhood design, uh, redevelopment, the uh, 100 plan, and public safety. City staff will be on hand for a question and answer period, plus information about services the city has to offer will also be available. We'll also have a representative there from uh, Metro, from Bolden Area Command there as well. For more information, contact my office at 702-229-5443. And then join me and community partners on Thursday, October 31st from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. for the community spooktacular carnival happening at the Doolittle Community Center. This event is geared to create a safe Halloween night for our children. Uh, we will have candy games, trunks, jumpers, petting zoo, and more. So bring your children and come out uh, to enjoy Halloween 2019 at Fabulous Ward 5. For more information, contact the office at 702-229-5443. And as always, to stay informed about what's going on in our ward in the city, please follow me on Twitter at Cedric Career, Instagram Councilman Career, and Facebook Councilman Cedric Career. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's get down to uh, Councilwoman Diaz, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this Friday, I will be having my second movie in the park. Um, we will be at Freedom, Gary Reese Freedom Park on 850 North Mojave Road, and I hope that you can call, all come down and uh, watch Coco with us. And um, it does start at dusk. Bring your chairs or your um, blankets, and uh, we provide water and popcorn. So come on down. Uh, next, I have. Um, we're having a Veterans Career Expo here at City Hall on Saturday, October 19th. This weekend is a busy one in terms of events. It's 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and um, it's all inclusive, mock interviews, LinkedIn workshops, resume writing, networking opportunities. So I hope veterans um, from our city take advantage of this wonderful opportunity and children are welcome and you can go ahead and register now. And the information is on your screen and it says if you have any questions, contact uh, Kelly Nash, 702-229-5931. The next thing that's happening this weekend is um, you're invited uh, to help end the op opioid crisis in Nevada. And so uh, Senator Dennis and many other um, electeds are holding uh, this basically uh, educational opportunity for families to identify potential warning signs of drug use or abuse. Sometimes as parents, we don't know if our children are doing drugs or things and uh, there will be a trailer out there outside of the East Las Vegas Library on Saturday, October 19th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. to kind of give us some telltale signs of uh, drug use or abuse. And I think this is so important as a parent for us to really know so that we can be involved and help our kids get the help they need. Um, and we also have another event on Saturday. It's a busy day. You're going to have lots to do on Saturday. Um, the Las Vegas Book Festival will be happening at the historic 5th Street School, uh, 401 South 4th Street. It is 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And if you want to visit our lasvegasbookfestival.com website, it'll lay out um, all the activities for the full schedule and list of appearances. And I know one year I went and, I, and my son was a big, uh, Thomas the Train fan, and we got to see Thomas there. So uh, check out what we're going to be hosting this year at a, our book festival. Um, 
We have, I have two more things to announce. I have a John S. Park Neighborhood Association neighborhood meeting next Tuesday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. at John S. Park Elementary, located at 931 Franklin Avenue in the multi-purpose room. And I look forward to seeing you and hearing from you there. And lastly, we have the Halloween Haunted Courtyard and Trunk or Treat on Thursday, October 24th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. It is free and open to the public at the East Las Vegas Community Center at 250 Northeastern Avenue. So if you have any questions about that, 702-229-1515. And I hope you have a spooktacular weekend. Cute. Cute. <laughs> Councilman Knudsen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I, there was two times today that I broke our normal protocol, so I, I appreciate you letting me do that, and I will try not to make a habit of it. Um, also, this last, I have, I'm practicing, I have slides now. That's, I'm trying really hard to keep up with everyone. Um, but real quick, so I was on the, at the, the, the fire prevention week last Saturday, and we had an amazing time at the fire department, so I want to send out my sincere appreciation for the fire department. I did get to blow up a watermelon. That was pretty, pretty cool. Um, we had a lot of people show up and learn about how to be safer in their homes. Um, coming up this Friday, we have Brews with Brian. Um, this is going to be at Coffee Pub on 2800 West Sahara Avenue, Friday, October 18th from 9 to 11 a.m. And Assemblywoman Rochelle Nguyen, who is in my neighborhood, uh, will also be joining us. And coming up on October 24th at Mirabelli Community Centers, it's a safe trick-or-treating for children under 10, starting at 6 p.m. and followed by Hocus Pocus, movie in the park at 7.30 p.m. With that, I will turn it over. Thank, Thank you. you. And now we go to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So before we start our runoff, I just want to recognize once again Councilwoman Seaman for her birthday. Happy birthday. And then, yes, and then we have Jeff down there. Is Jeff still here? Jeff is gone. He Happy birthday to Jeff, too. But my secretary, Felicia Dorcuck, it is her birthday today, and she is the girl that goes every Monday to the florist, buys everyone flowers, makes arrangements, and gives everyone their flowers wow. all week long. And it's her birthday, so I had to order flowers <laughs> because I couldn't have her make her own. I couldn't have her make her own flowers. So happy birthday, Felicia, and uh, I just I really appreciate you. Um, and now we will we will begin with our. Vegas born tomorrow night. Uh, our next Golden Knights game is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, so let's support our, our, our Knights. Go Knights, go. And then we have our, are we going to Nevada Day? Because my, all of my, there we go. Uh, commemorating the state of Nevada's admission into the Union on October 31st, 1864. We observe Nevada Day here on October 25th. So the happy birthday, Nevada. Nevada Day is here. We have our Halloween at the Y on Halloween. And thank you, Incorp, for helping us with that. We are going to have a haunted house in the YMCA. We're going to have trunk or treat, lots of great cars, including the Raiders ambulance, um, giving out candy. We'll have our stage and DJ, and it's a party. It's always a party in my ward. So please join us at the Y on Halloween from 5 to 8, which is October 31st. Bring the whole family in your costume and enjoy the fun. After our Halloween, we're going to have our, our normal meeting, Meet with Michelle, on Friday, November 1st from 9 to 11, and I'll serve you some coffee and donuts, and we will talk about our ward, our issues, and get everything resolved, all in a matter of two hours. That is some good wow. stuff there. We also, um, it's fallback, so that is Sunday. So the, before, you, before we come back to City Council, on Sunday, November 3rd at 2 a.m., fallback one hour daylight savings time is happening. So let's not forget that. And then, you know, I want to start ending with some of our- Daylight savings is over. Yes. It's not happening. It's over. It's over. Yes. Now we're back. We're going to fall back. Standard. Yes. Right. Yep. Ending of daylight savings time. Uh, fall back one hour. So I usually, like, if I'm going to sleep at 10 Sunday night, I just set my clock back. Right. You yeah. Should. Yeah. Um, so we are going to begin with uh, some success stories from our Corridor of Hope. And the homeless success story that I'm going to start this series off with is a gentleman named Harlan Thompson. 
Harlan Thompson is a single father who recently regained custody of his four children. He started as a volunteer at the courtyard in 2017 and was hired as an operations worker in 2018. Through his employment, he was able to secure and maintain a stable living environment which allowed the courts to return his children into his custody. I, this, is from, this is from Harlan. He says, I was, determined, I was terminated from my job, facing eviction from my apartment. The use of drugs played a big role in my homelessness. After getting evicted, I went with my kids to Catholic Charities. After not being able to get assistance from anywhere, one of the workers from Catholic Charities walked us to the courtyard. The courtyard was able to provide me with housing assessment, mental health evaluation to ensure I was still in the right state of mind, job placement and employment, and also provide me with housing. All that in as little as six months. Just the amount of support and faith that they had in me to get things done was enough of an impact for me. The extent that they are willing to go for me and my children says a lot. To know that there are people out there who want you to succeed helped me out a lot. As long as you're willing to do the legwork, the help is there. After all that work, I now have my kids from DFC. I'm having trouble hearing you. And live in a big apartment, thanks to the folks at the courtyard. So I just want to give our corridor of hope kudos, and you'll be hearing success stories from our homeless and what we do here in the city of Las Vegas. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing on our missing children? Not today. Okay. Yeah. That was very nice. Well, um, just a couple of things. Uh, Councilman Anthony had to leave, and of course, this is the weekend, uh, the fall weekend of the Mayor's Cup International Soccer Tournament for the younger group um, all over the city, but at Betty Wilson Park for sure. And uh, from the 25th to the 27th, so please come out. We've got so many of our local teams and our youngsters playing, but having teams come in from around the world, um, so it's really exciting. And our next city council, as you know, um, is set up for Wednesday, November 30th at 9. Uh, most specifically, as uh, Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, with Halloween coming up, be cautious, be careful. Parents watch your children and make sure you check everything that they pick up in their pillowcases, bags, um, pumpkins, whatever. Um, and make it a safe one for everyone. And again, uh, as always, we want to thank our city manager and his team, um, our city clerks who are here. We welcome Cheyenne, who's alive still through the day. Certainly our public information office has returned. They started off this morning and they had to return because we switched things around. Want to thank our IT department behind the one-way glass and also right there where you're always visible to us. And then again, significantly to thank um, our marshals who are always watching us and taking care of us, and our city council for all that you do. Life is fun, life is good, life is healthy, life is full of celebration and birthdays. Happy birthday. <laughs> and to Kelly, and to everybody who wants to have a birthday, have a birthday. And you're <laughs> forgiven anytime you want to do the little off things. When's your birthday? I would rather not say this. Well, uh, before, uh, uh, between now and the 6th, right? Okay. So am I allowed to ask you how old you are? No, I won't do that because it's very, very sophisticated. I am 41, which I think from our first council meeting, I learned that at 40, you can say anything you want, whenever you want. Is that true? <laughs> That's so what I'm, my mother told I'm, me. I'm, I will be 41, so I'm looking forward to oh, that. Oh, it is going to be a great time. <laughs> no, my parents, my mother said that to me. I don't want to hear from you until you're 40. And when you're 40, you can say whatever you want within reason. But anyway, we thank you all, and it's just uh, be safe, be healthy, be careful and always help somebody and so we thank you all have a great weekend when you get to it and happy birthday coming